Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to each and every one of you for the first ever joint regional meeting organized by the Sri Lanka Medical Association together with the General Practitioners Association of Ratnapura and the Provincial Directorate of Health Services, Sabragamo Province. Strengthening primary care physicians for effective management of common ailments. That is the theme for the day and the goal of the SLMA the General Practitioners Association of Ratnapura and the Provincial Directorate of Health Services for Sabaragamu, who are collaborating to lay down the foundations for a great partnership that will bring immense value to uplifting the primary health care in the Ratnapura region. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, to officially start off the proceedings, it is my pleasure to cordially invite Dr. Vinya Arya Ratna the President of the Sri Lanka Medical Association to present the objectives of the meeting. Thank you, Sandun. Uh, good morning. My good friend, uh, Dr. Kapila Kannangara, Provincial Director of Health Services, uh, Sabaragamua Province. Uh, Dr. Srini Alahapiruma, Regional Director, Health Services, Ratnapura. Dr. W.A.C. Premathilaka, President General Practitioners Association, Ratnapura, Dr. Lahiru Kodituaku, Assistant Secretary, SLMA, and all our resource persons for today, Dr. Chintaka uh, Hathalawatta, uh, sorry, uh, consultant cardiologist, who happened to be also my student at Sri Jayavadhanapura University, and uh, Dr. Uh, Chaturya Sirivardhana, Consultant Dermatologist at the BH Balangode, and Dr. Sanjeeva Kalwarachi, Consultant uh, Vitaru uh, Retinal Surgeon, uh, Ratna, Teaching Hospital Ratnapura, Dr. Shalini Fernando, uh, Specialist in Primary Care and Family Medicine, uh, Ministry of Health, and all the other consultants and also the medical officers who are here in person, and also those of you who are joining online quite a large number of uh, doctors from the province are joining online and also our council members and also the others, other members of SLMA who are joining this uh, joint uh, meeting, joint regional meeting uh, organized by the Sri Lanka Medical Association and also Provincial Director of, Directorate of uh, Health, Health Services in uh, Sabaragamu province and also the uh, General Practitioners Association of Ratnapura. It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you as the President of Sri Lanka Medical Association. This year our theme is towards human health care, equity, sorry, excellence, equity and community. Manava Hitavadi Saukya Sevavak, Vishishtatvaya, Sadharanatvaya, Prajava. Why we decided on this theme for this year is that last three years at least we have been facing a enormous crisis, firstly the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic and followed by the economic crisis. One of the sectors that were very uh, adversely affected was the health sector. But despite all these external shocks, the health sector, thanks to you all who are committed to provide a quality health services to our people, continued with commitment and under very severe resource constraints to provide whatever the best of services you can both preventive and curative. However, in the process we know there are challenges that we face, how to maintain standards, how to maintain quality. So that's why we brought in excellence. Then also we know if you take for example the Sabaragamua province and other provinces, there are disparities, there are differences in the health outcomes which are not really directly related to the provision of health services because health services are free and accessible, supposed to be accessible, affordable to the entire population of this country. That's how we have achieved very good standards of health in terms of our key indices like the infant mortality rate, the maternal mortality rate, life expectancy and so on. But we see significant disparities between provinces, between uh, districts, between socio-economic groups. So equity is very important that we need to eliminate somehow through collective efforts, these differences that we find, which are what we call social determinants, because these are determinants that, that are affecting the health outcomes, which need to be tackled, not just by the health sector, but other sectors as well. So that's why in the health, uh, in the SLMA, we have expert committees on different 
specialized areas where we bring in even non-medical people to address some of these key issues. For example, the road traffic accidents are really increasing at this time. So only the health sector can't do. We have number one cause of admissions, you all know better than myself, is trauma and injuries. So how do we address this? So we have uh, an expert committee which, which has representation from the engineering field, from law enforcement, uh, from other uh, sectors which are related to like road maintenance. It is a collective effort. So the idea of having joint regional meetings is to update on update the knowledge of our uh, doctors to be able to provide a better quality service. Then in the process we need to engage with citizens as well, community. So today's topic, uh, strengthening primary care, uh, phys uh, care physicians for effective management of common ailments is that we need to somehow decentralize and provide best of care uh, to our population at a time when we are facing all these resource constraints. People find difficult to go to um, tertiary care hospitals and also not necessary. We know that 80% of our ailments can be tackled at a lower level. But because of the system and because of the uh, easy access sometimes, the people tend to go to institutions of a higher level. But also there are uh, legitimate uh, issues faced by the people. Sometimes the, uh, the, uh, the doctors are not there or due to card problems or then the supplies are not there, the medicines are not there. So now in that situation, there had been attempts by the health ministry, by the government to introduce primary health care. Uh, best example is the primary health care strengthening project which has been I think Sabargamu has performed really well and it has proven that it's a good solution to both resource constraints and long term um, uh, systems uh, strengthening uh, in the health sector of Sri Lanka. So that's why we uh, decided that this year which is the 187 uh, yeah, we, the Sri Lanka Medical Association has been in existence for 187 years and it's the apex organization which has uh, representation from all categories of doctors, those doctors who are in the government service, specialists, non-specialists, those who are in the private sector and also the non-government sector. So as the apex organization of all doctors in Sri Lanka, we started going to all the provinces having these joint meetings and clinical meetings. So that's why we organize this meeting today on this very important topic of strengthening primary care. And we have uh, the expert panel, the names of whom I have just mentioned, uh, uh, delivering the best of knowledge that is available in those subtopics. And I'm very uh, pleased that the director of uh, the provincial director of uh, directorate of health services and the General Practitioners Association of uh, Ratnapura came forward to, uh, uh, to partner with uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association to have this uh, joint uh, regional meeting today. So the rest of the year also we have a lot of meetings. I in invite all of you. Now all our meetings are, can be accessed online. If you can't join live, they are all saved in the uh, YouTube channel of SLMA very rich material is there at your convenience you can uh, you can access and also improve your knowledge so i thank all of you for joining this uh, joint regional meeting today and i wish the deliberations all success thank you uh, now i would like to cordially invite dr kapila khannangar the Pro uh, Provincial Director of Health Services for Sabragamo Province to deliver the opening remarks. Uh, <coughs> good morning to everyone. And uh, first and foremost, uh, let me welcome every one of you to Sabragamo and uh, people who have come from Colombo and uh, all the dear colleagues who are from Sabaragamu. Uh, warm welcome to the Provincial Director's Office, right. Uh, Dr. Vinaya Ariratna, I think uh, this is a household name uh, starting from his dear father, you know him quite well, uh, heard his name around the country for many years, uh, Dr. A.T. Ariratna, the founder of Sarvode, uh, who has touched the hearts and the minds of many people in this country and also 
many people outside this country. So, it doesn't need any more explanation on uh, the work of Sarvodhya and uh, Dr. A.T.R. Ratna and also Dr. Vinaya Ratna who is continuing the same work in the same vein and uh, I think since he has become the president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, he has revamped the uh, actions and the itineraries of the association and it has been rejuvenated uh, since his uh, taking over as the president of the uh, SLMA. So many congratulations to him and uh, wish him, I wish you all the very best in continuing this uh, magnificent work. And uh, also uh, to partner the Sri Lanka Medical Association, uh, our uh, from Ratnapura, the General Practitioners Association from Ratnapura has come forward and has been a very active association for the last couple of years. And uh, there are, I think most of the uh, practicing doctors are members of this association. And it's a very proud moment for me actually uh, that you have managed to organize uh, a meeting of this magnitude. Uh, I think for a long time we didn't have uh, a session like this because due to obvious reasons with the pandemic and with these uh, uh, other uh, difficulties uh, in our setup over the last three, four years. So this is actually a very proud and a very significant moment uh, to uh, have this joint, uh, regional joint meeting uh, and also especially the theme that you, you, you have chosen. Uh, it's uh, primary, uh, strengthening primary uh, health care physicians for effective management of common ailments. And uh, thank you very much for both the SLMA and the General Practitioners Association of Ratnapura. And also all the uh, doctors who are participating today physically as well as many of them who are, part, who are joining this uh, meeting uh, online. So thank you very much and uh, I uh, wish you all very well and uh, let's have a good session and also especially uh, when I see the uh, panel of resource people it's so heartening to see such eminent fig uh, figures who are uh, delivering some uh, lectures today. Dr. Hatra uh, who is I think a well known name in Ratnapura for a long time now. Uh, consultant cardiologist Chintaka, thank you very much for being a resource today. And uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Chaturanga Sirivadana, uh, consultant dermatologist from Balangoda. And uh, Dr. Sanjeeva Kaluvarachi, uh, consultant with uh, uh, your regional surgeon. And Dr. Shalini Fernando, specialist in primary care and family medicine. So this the primary health care which you have chosen and the theme that the SLMA chosen goes very well along with the primary health care that we are experiencing today. That is excellence, equity and the community. Well, today after I think you must understand that we are going through a phase, the initial phase of primary health care restructuring in this country. Since uh, 2019, when the restructuring program started, then there were many consultations, and Dr. Vini Aratna was a key figure in, uh, in restructuring uh, the primary health care at that time. And uh, since then, we have come over three and a half years. Uh, we have been funded by World Bank funds, which have been uh, uh, together with the local funds, um, and also uh, the ADB, uh, which came in after that uh, with the clustering of the primary health care institutions. Now, primary health care uh, means now we are, we are, we are uh, providing services at primary health care, secondary and tertiary uh, levels. And if you, if you go by uh, statistics, uh, Sabaragama province has 96 primary medical care units primary medical care units. 
and there are another 51 primary medical care institutions uh, in the province. That is the division of hospitals A, B, and C. And we have eight base hospitals. We have the teaching hospital Ratnapura, which is like our father to all the satellite hospitals that we have in Ratnapura, and the Kegol uh, District General Hospital, which caters to the people of Kegol. And uh, so with this setup, uh, we have started providing uh, health care, primary health care, which has been a prominent source of uh, health care uh, during the last three years, especially during the COVID time. You will remember that you went through a very tough time, very hard times, trying to provide services for the people when many of the uh, professionals in this country were at home. But the doctors, the nurses, the health staff were uh, at the height of their activity and height of their uh, services during that time uh, trying to uh, prevent and uh, care for the COVID patients as well as for the rest of the population. So during that time, these primary health care institutions provided a lot of services to the people at the doorstep, at the village level. And after that, following the pandemic, We've had a, a serious uh, two years of uh, economic crisis in this country where people's uh, economic situations went down to very low levels. And uh, again, the primary health care institutions have come to their uh, service because um, it sort of prevent, it, it was quite tough for them to find resources to travel at that time with the soaring. Uh, prices of fuel and, and the transport, transportation. So the primary health care, which was mainly most of the uh, primary prime PMCUs were at the village level and they are closer to their residences and it provided the uh, services to the people uh, at the doorstep. So all these provisions have given people a lot of, li uh, a lot of life uh, strengthening situations. But we have issues in, in this pro providing this primary health care. That's where this, um, the excellence and uh, the uh, equity and the community comes into play. Because we have, say, the 96 uh, PMCUs we have, we have managed to keep them afloat amid a lot of challenges. First of all, it's the HR, the human resource. Uh, well, we have been getting doctors, but the turnover has been very high because they come and within about a year or two, they go off maybe for uh, higher studies, maybe for now the present uh, tendency is to immigrate. And uh, we have had issues in dealing with that. And then all, obviously we've had a shortage of drugs over the last uh, few months, I would say about a year, and uh, that also has uh, prevented people from uh, seeking medical care from the primary medical care institutions, because that was one of the reasons when we started the uh, discussions, deliberations about the restrengthening or the restructuring. That was one of the reasons uh, which was uh, very eminent, why the people were bypassing the primary health care institutions, because it was a shortage of drugs uh, in those primary medical care institutions. So that was one of the uh, very uh, prominent DLIs which was put forward by the World Bank. DLIs means indicators, that is uh, uh, disbursement link indicators, which was put forward by the World Bank that it should be met. But again, unfortunately, we are facing uh, some, sometimes it's severe shortages, sometimes it wavers from being severe to moderate but shortages of uh, medicines where the out-of-pocket expenditure uh, of people has gone up to 50 percent in this country now. So it's not very favorable because they say that any country which provides free medical care, the out-of-pocket expenditure should be less than 30 percent. Right. So this is the situation we have and uh, uh, after three and a half years of uh, the World Bank and the uh, ADB, that is PSSP and the HSCP 
projects uh, which we have carried out in uh, in the whole country the PSSP and uh, ADB projects which we have carried out in four provinces we have come to a situation where we need to look back and see whether we have achieved those indicators which the Ministry of Health as a policy has uh, brought out but uh, we see that there is a, uh, a quite a shortage of reaching those indicators because uh, just uh, one week ago we had a, a progress review and there was an independent survey done by Professor Poole and uh, they are one of the key indicators that caught my attention and uh, a bit alarming was that the patient satisfaction from the primary medical care institutions in all provinces, not only Sabaragamu, from the four provinces and mainly the other provinces as well, is less than 50 percent. It was actually less than about 40 percent. So that's something that we need to uh, take into consideration because if the people are not satisfied with the services that we give, then there is something missing. So we need to uh, think seriously about it. We have the institutions in place. We have the, most of the time the doctors are in place, the rest of the health staff is in place. There may be some issues with the shortage of drugs and you know equipment sometimes, but still, we still can provide the people with uh, a satisfactory service. So that's where we are lacking now. We need to step up, we need to think about it, we need to uh, dedicate ourselves and give these services to the satisfaction of the people. Because the last word, the community, the, uh, you know, uh, communities that we now, with the restructuring, uh, we have got the community also involved in the primary health care in our services. It's called the community engagement. And then there is a system where there is a GRS, a grievance redress system, where it is also for the community to come and uh, complain or even give, uh, give their opinions and suggestions to the uh, ministry. So there is a direct link to the Ministry of Health and people can complain about our services to the Ministry of Health. So we need to be a bit careful also about it because we don't know at what time a, a, a sort of an inquiry might start. So we need to be careful and we need more than that, I think we need to be more dedicated in uh, providing these services, at, uh, especially at primary health care. So this is my message to all of you. Um, we need to improve on our services, we need to improve on our attitudes towards the services and we need to really sit there and do the needful. Thank you very much again, Dr. Vinaya Ratna, for this wonderful contribution uh, to the uh, medical fraternity of Sabaragamu and uh, also thank the General Practice Association of Ratnapura uh, and the President, the Vice President who has, I think Dr. Chaminda has been uh, instrumental in organizing this event with the President and the rest of the uh, members of the association. Thank you very much again. Hope you have a good time today. Thanks. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, at this moment, it is my pleasure to invite Dr. W. A. C. Prematilaka, the President of the General Practitioners Society of Ratnapura, to deliver his remarks. President, uh, members of uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association, Provincial Director, uh, Health Service in Sabragamua, Regional Director, Health Service in Ratnapura, all the consultants, my dear members, Ratnapura GP Association, other doctors from Ratnapura area, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning to all of you. It is pleasure to welcome you all to this joint meeting organized by the Sri Lanka Medical Association in collaboration with Ratnapura GP Association with uh, Provincial Director Health Service, Sabragamu Province. On strengthening the primary care positions for effective management of common ailments. ailments. As the President of GP Association, Ratnapura, I am very glad to 
today on this special occasion. A stepping forward with the Almata Declaration on Primary Health Care Service in 1978 with the vision of health for all, government medical officers as well as private sector general practitioners play an important role in delivering initial primary health care in primary health care system in Sri Lanka. The conference strongly affirms that the health is fundamental human rights. In achieving sustainable development 2030 health goals, the knowledge and skill in advancement of the medical fields need to reach every medical officer in government and private sector, central as well as in the rural area. In private sector, GPs are more recognized and trustful by the patients. People respect their guidance, treatment and are more familiar with their family doctors. The idea of the Ratnapura GPA originated and fruitful with continuous discussions of a small group of senior GPs in Ratnapura few years back. It is my pleasure to mention their names who are the keystones of this small house. Dr. Chaminda, Dr. Viraman, Dr. Um, Vipula Indralal, Dr. Chandana, Dr. Vilegoda, Dr. Chaminda, uh, Dr. Mahinda, and Dr. Ajit, Dr. Jaisiri was there in the first day of the, our start of the organization. With the team effect of the GPRS was Ratnapura was established and funded in 2013, 2017, six years back. The con constitution was developed and office bias was appointed with their members suggestions. The chairman, secretary, treasurer and there are office, bias, office bearers and co-panels also. As a GB association of Ratnapura got registered in the Sri Lanka and there was a bank account for our organization. We collected admission fee, monthly memberships work, uh, to enhance our fund. Within the period of last six years, we have about senior GPs around 50 from Palmadulla to Avisavilla. Today is the GPR has become main gathering point for the general practitioners with their aim to further enhance in the professional medical as well as non-medical knowledge and their welfare. We conduct, we conduct monthly EME sessions with the help of our consultants from Gen, uh, Gen Teaching Hospital Ratnapura. We followed up with the dinner and the cocktail in uh, hotels. GP, GP, our association has always been with our members. We donate 100,000 rupees per members, family members funeral. Further, we annually go into the night out with our families in a five-star hotels. We are gathering year-end family get-together for last few years and we are uh, we are celebrate our Tamil and um, New Year festivals with our, with our families and our kids. We are planning to start our kids talent show in this year. We try to keep the members updated with their medical knowledge and also to relax their members and keep their with happy. We as a team take a very possible effect to fulfill our necessities of the members and provide patients friendly health care service to our community. I wish to extend my warm appreciation and gratitude to President and the members of Sri Lanka Medical Association, to Dr.
Kapila Kanangara, Director Provincial Sabragamu, and Dr. Chandana Gunawardana. He is the key man and the backbone of today's event. Uh, he was the main person organizing the, this event. Finally, I hope as a GPR member, primary health care providing medical officer who are gathered here will get the maximum benefit from today's sessions and extend the cure to sector of the primary health care system in Sri Lanka. Thank you all. Thank you very much. We have arrived at a much awaited moment of today's proceedings towards the academic component. Today's sessions include a number of very informative and valuable lectures that will address some of the more frequent and contemporary conditions that are encountered in primary healthcare today. To start off the sessions, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to the audience this great personality who will be conducting the first session. He graduated as an eager and capable doctor from the University of Sri Jawaradhanapura in the year 1999 and obtained an MD from the University of Colombo by the year 2005, following which he underwent overseas training in Newcastle in the United Kingdom in the year 2010. He has kept an excellent record for his exceptional services in his previous stations such as the National Hospital of Kandy, the Provincial General Hospital Badulla and Teaching Hospital Kurnagala. Currently, he is serving as a consultant cardiologist at the Teaching Hospital of Ratnapura as well as a visiting lecturer and an external examiner for Sabragama University of Sri Lanka. It is my absolute pleasure to invite Dr. Chintaka Hatalavatta to address the gathering on the topic of heart failure, what is new. Good morning everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here with you today to share my knowledge about heart failure. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers, SLMA and PD office, as well as the uh, General Practitioners Association of uh, Ratnapura for giving me this opportunity uh, to be with you today. And uh, the task given by you for me today is to discuss about heart failure, which is a very common condition which we see in our day-to-day -day life as practicing uh, doctors. Now, uh, without taking much time, let me, uh, let me go through my objectives. First, I'll take you through the, uh, the classification of heart failure, the new classification. Heart failure management, as you all know, has been evolved, changed a lot during the last few years. Actually, I can remember when I was a house officer here, worked here in this hospital, Ratnapura. My, my SHO is also there here now. When I was a house officer, my SHO is there now. Veeraman is there, Dr. Veeraman. Now, uh, we, as you can remember, Dr. Veeraman, we, uh, our heart failure management was very, very basic and very simple. We gave Lasix, Frusamide and Digoxin, that's all. Now we have a lot of other agents and a lot of other modalities to improve the outcome of our patients. Now we'll go through the classification, the latest classification of heart failure. And there are a few biomarkers which are actually uh, uh, not very, pra I mean, practical we don't use, but for research purposes and lab purposes. And what is GDMP, M MT, Guideline Directed Medical Treatment. We'll have, just have a look. And we'll, I'll be touching a little on this CRT, we'll go through these uh, parts later on, and LV assist devices a little. And of course, of course about revascularization. And little bit on rehabilitation, which is very, very important. Rehabilitation of a patient with heart failure. So you all know this is a, 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 a university stuff, you can remember now there are a lot of courses for heart failure starting from ischemic heart disease and rare ones like autoimmune courses, myocarditis, 
But you, you see, in our day-to-day -day life, we see all these causes coming. Right? Now classification, this is actually uh, quite a new classification. There are two classifications actually. First one is, you know, our old classification, NYHA. It depends on the clinical symptomatology. The patient, you take the history from patient, and patient says shortness of breath, dyspnea and all. So you grade the patient depending on the symptomatology, NYHA, class 1 to class 4. Now this is, this classification depends on the ejection fraction, echo findings of the heart, uh, heart failure patient. So depending on the ejection fraction, you classify. So this is, if the ejection fraction is less than 40, you call it heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, reduced EF. And if the heart or the, the ejection fraction is more than 50, then you call it heart failure but with preserved ejection fraction. In between cases, between 40 to 49, you call it mildly reduced ejection fraction. So you can classify this depending on the, the, the class you are in, the treatment modality changes. Now, your initial diagnosis may be one of them. Reduce ejection fraction, mildly reduced or preserved. For example, if you take a patient, uh, uh, now myocarditis, it's not very uncommon, especially with now the leptospirosis, we see a lot of patients who are having myocarditis, leptomyocarditis. The initial diagnosis, when you do the first echo, the ejection fraction may be 40, but later on when you do follow-up echoes, serial echoes, maybe after three months, six months, sometimes the patient's ejection fraction may be improved. So these type of scenarios, you can label the patient forever. This heart failure will re reduce ejection fraction. You might change the diagnosis later on depending on the repeat echo findings. Now therefore, you can start with 40 and certain people, they improve. You can start from uh, mildly reduced ejection fraction and then they might go into a normal ejection fraction and sometimes you, you can see certain people, they deteriorate. So you can see the, uh, so the repeat echo, the ejection fraction is worse than the, the previous one. So likewise we have, we have to reclassify depending on the findings. Now this is one other thing, other than these classifications, so certain people they have improved ejection fraction from 40 to less than 40 to between 40 and 50. So this is called heart failure with improved ejection fraction. This is a classification. Now this is <coughs> one new, it's not very new but uh, quite uncommon, unknown actually, it's not uncommon, unknown symptom, bendopnea. Anybody you know? About, uh, you have come across this word before, bendopnea. You know paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, orthopnea, very common uh, symptomatology, symptoms. But this is a new, new, I mean, not a new symptom, they have described uh, recently. A respiratory symptom occurs while bending forward. When the patient bends forward, you f the patient feels dysnic. It's not very uncommon if you have a uh, huge uh, belly, you, you, you also can find I mean, you, you can't do this. You might find it difficult to do, do this, but it's not heart failure always. It's not a specific symptom, but they, they have described if the patient has this symptom, the, that means the patient is in uh, uh, significant, sorry, patient is in uh, severe heart failure. That is called bendopnea. Bending forward, the patient feels dysnic. Investigations, you know, I'm not going to go through all these investigations from the ECG, full blood count, urine and electrolytes, glucose, liver functions, iron, thyroid. So these are important and then you do uh, echocardiography to classify the patient and to uh, plan the management. And cardiac MRI, we don't do routinely, but certain patients, especially myocarditis and cardiomyopathies, they might need this. Uh, get the proper diagnosis. Now this is actually, uh, we don't use this in our day-to-day -day practice, but it's important if you know this. This is a marker, it's like troponin. Troponin, we are familiar with, you all familiar with troponin. It's like troponin, but that's not a good 
Spe the, the specificity of the test is not good. I mean, it's not non-specific, but sensitive. That means if you suspect a patient is having heart failure, you do basic investigation, but they are not, not, not uh, conclusive. You do echo, but vague. Echo may be normal, but still the patient is having symptoms. You wonder whether this is actually heart failure or not. Then you can do this BNP or pro-BNP. If it is positive, then you can say this could be heart failure, but if it, the important thing is if it is negative, the negative predictive value is good. If it is negative, you can safely say this is not heart failure. So negative value is important. And at the same time, there is a prognostic value as well. If a patient admits with the features of heart failure, you do troponin. If you can do, if you have facilities, you do this, uh, the, the BNP. If BNP or pro-BNP is positive, that means the patient is in, uh, in, a, in a bad condition actually. The outcomes are not good. And uh, then you can compare the pre-discharge value on admission and the pre-discharge value. If you can compare these values, if there's a significant drop from the day of admission and when you are discharging, that means you have done a good job. The patient's the, uh, the outcome will be better compared to a fellow who is having the steady uh, levels of uh, BNP or rising BNP. Otherwise, the patient may be, I mean, symptomatically patient may be okay, but if the markers are high, that means then the outcome or the, re the, the possibility of uh, the risk of readmissions and worsening heart failure is high. The levels are high. Then we'll move on to the management. You know, the lifestyle changes, we, we all know these basics. The phys regular physical activity and uh, obesity is to avoid obesity, normal blood pressure is very important. Blood sugar and blood pressure is very, very important to control. And smoking cessation and diet, especially DASH. This is a dietary approach to prevent hypertension actually, but this is important in heart failure management as well, especially low salt diet and all. Which I'm not going to go into fine details. Now, influence of vaccination, pneumococcal, so these are the actually parts of our heart failure management. Now in ideal setting, you need to have a multidisciplinary team. In our hospital actually, we are lucky to have this, the, all the team, everybody is there. Actually in our unit, in our, in our hospital, we are running a rehabilitation program, especially after heart attacks, myocardial infarctions. We have all these. Nurses are there, pharma, pharma, pharmacy, pharma, pharma, uh, pharmacists are there, dietitians, including consultant uh, nutritionist, and mental health clinicians, psychiatrists, and social workers, primary. So all are there with us in managing our patients. We are lucky in that way. So guideline directed medical therapy. What is this? Now we know there are there are drugs we are using in managing heart failure patients, certain drugs are prognostic drugs, which gives prognostic benefits in managing heart failure. Certain drugs are symptomatic. You give these drugs to manage the symptoms only. Now, there are, these are new drugs actually. New one, this is called ARNI. This is actually, we know ARNI is angiotensin receptor nephrolyzing inhibitor available in our country, expensive, available. Now, I'm, I'm not going to go into these details, the research details, but this is something similar to AC inhibitor, which we are using for a long time. AC inhibitor, angiotensin, angiotensin receptor blockers, losartan group or captopinilapil group. So this is something related to that. But compared to, so this is the drug actually, one, one drug which is available in our country. The same group, AC inhibitor, ARBO, ARNI. So they have studied, the evidence are there, ARNI is superior to AC inhibitor and ARB. So if you have a facility, if the patient is, patient can afford, this is the uh, best drug at the moment uh, in heart failure. You can actually replace AC inhibitor or ARB if this is available, but the problem is it's not available in the government sector and it's expensive. But uh, the research have shown a lot of 
beneficial effects. Beta blockers, we know for a long time, which are during our, our, our internship days, beta blockers are out, contraindicated in heart failure. Don't give beta blockers, that, that can kill. Now, it has changed, reversed. Now they say, beta blockers, you should give beta blockers, certain beta blockers, not all, especially bisoprolol, carvedilol and metaprolol, sustained release forms, can be used for heart failure, they are prognostic drugs. You need to give, unless it's contraindicated. These drugs are must. And you know this, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, very common drugs, which we have with these drugs, uh, spinalactone and epirinone, both the same group actually. Spinalactone is, is a good, it's a diuretic. Again, has a prognostic benefit. She has shown prognostic benefit in heart failure. Epirinone is the same, actually, more or less the same, but this is more specific. What is the, what is the problem you get if you give this uh, spinal lactone, especially high doses, what is the patient main complaint? Painful gynecomastia, that is one side effect. It's not there with this epirinone, won't cause so the same drug, but this is more specific, receptor specific, so you don't get gynecomastia. Right? So this is again a must drug. Now, uh, again, they have shown the latest, latest report, uh, researchers, ARNI, which we, are, which we are discussing about, is, is very superior to ACE inhibitors and uh, it, had, it has been uh, shown benefits in marginal cases of heart failure as well. Now what about this, SGLT2 inhibitors? What is this? Glyphosins. They are anti-diabetic drugs. So primarily these are anti-diabetic drugs, but when they study, uh, they have see, uh, seen that the other than the diabetic, anti-diabetic uh, properties, they have shown significant reduction of uh, mortality in heart failure patients. So there's a, this is actually, now from from endocrinologists, we have taken this drug. We have we have taken this drug. Okay? This is our drug now, heart failure. It's a must. So, irrespective of the sugar levels, the patient's sugar level, you need to give this in heart failure. Patient may be non-diabetic, still, we can give this low dose. 10 milligrams of empagliflozin is enough. It won't cause any sugar issues. It's a mild anti-diabetic drug, you can give safely. Uh, so again, a prognostically important drug in heart failure. It's a new one, it's freely available now, We're not very expensive. Uh, so these are the evidence. They have shown 30%, more than 30% reduction of heart failure hospitalization. It's a huge number. Risk of cardiovascular death was lowered 18%. Depoglyphosine and all-cause mortality, mortality is about 17% reduction by just by introducing this, this new agent. It's very important. The dose is 10 milligram and you can increase if necessary, empagliflozin. And there are very rare uh, uh, issues like uh, you, uh, glycemic ketoacidosis and genital and soft tissue infections. If certain people, if they get uh, recurrent genital infections and all, then they can't tolerate, they won't be able to tolerate this drug, but otherwise, this is a well tolerated, very good drug, low doses. Right? Now, hydralazine and isosobidinide, again, it's not well, in, uh, not well established in our practice, but they have shown that you can be, uh, this can be given as a treatment in advanced heart failure, again with a prognostic benefit. Yeah? Are you ready? Again, it's a, it's, a, it's a common drug now with us, a blocker, but compared to beta blocker and calcium channel blockers, there's no blood pressure reduction. So this is the importance of this. Iobradine can just bring your heart rate down without touching the blood pressure. So if the patient's blood pressure is marginal, then you can safely start, start this drug on and then you can monitor the heart rate. Now, now when you are managing heart failure patients, you know I, the, the agents which I have mentioned here, 
ऑलमोस्ट ओल्ड ड्रग्स आर एंटी हाइपरटेंसिव आनी एस इनबीटस एंटी हाइपरटेंसिव बीटा ब्लॉकर्स एंटी हाइपरटेंसिव मिनरल कॉर्टिकॉइड स्पाइनल एक्टोन एंटी हाइपरटेंसिव सो वेन यू गिव दीज ड्रग्स द ब्लड प्रेशर टेन टू गेट लोवर सो मोस्ट ऑफ द टाइम वट यू सी इज पेशेंट विथ मार्जिनल इन लो ब्लड प्रेशर जस्ट मेन्टेन इन द ब्लड प्रेशर इज हंड्रेड एंड टेन हंड्रेड एंड ट्वेंटी लाइक्स इसलिए दैसली मे बी एटी नाइंटी रेंज मे बी सेवेंटी एटी स्टील द हार्ट रेट इज हई इन हार्ट फेलि यु टारगेट हार्ट रेट इज बिटवीन सिक्सटी एंड फिफ्टी एंड सिक्सटी एट रेस्ट विथ फर मिनिट फिफ्टी एंड सिक्सटी सो इफ यू कांट अचीव दिस हार्ट रेट विथ द रूटीन ड्रग्स विच वी आर गिविंग यू कैन कंसिडर दिस ड्रग बिकॉज देर नो ब्लड प्रेशर रिडक्शन यू कैन सेफली ब्रिंग डाउन द हार्ट रेट टू योर टारगेट द इनिशियल डोज इज फाइव मिलीग्राम स्पीड बट प्रैक्टिकली वी गिव टू पॉइंट फाइव मिलीग्राम टू अ डे एंड सी द रेस्पॉन्स एंड देन वी इंक्रीज यू कैन गो अप टू सेवन पॉइंट फाइव मिलीग्राम टू अ डे सो योर टारगेट इज द ब्लड प्रेशर टारगेट इज दिस फिफ्टी टू सिक्सटी बीट पर मिनिट एट रेस्ट रेस्टिंग हार्ट रेट ओके नाउ दिस इज अगेन ओमेगा थ्री दे हैव अ लॉट ऑफ डिस्कस अबाउट दिस बट देर आर नो मेजर मेजर बेनिफिट्स एक्चुअली यू कैन कंसिडर बट द बेनिफिट इज मार्जिनल एंड दिस इज ऑल्सो इम्पोर्टेंट हिमोग्लोबिन करेक्शन मोस्ट ऑफ द टाइम वी फॉगेट टू डू दिस करेक्शन ऑफ हिमोग्लोबिन एंड द फेरिटीन लेवल दे से इज द पेशेंट इज हैविंग हार्ट फेलि यू हैव टू डू पीरियोडिकली द फेरिटीन लेवल स्पेशली इफ द फेरिटीन इज लेस दैन हंड्रेड दे से इन आइडियल सेटिंग यू नीड टू गिव फेरिक कार्बोक्सीमोलिटीज इन आई वी प्रिपरेशन विच इज नॉट फ्रीली अवेलेबल इन अवर कंट्री बट यू कैन ट्राई ओर आर प्रिपरेशन बट आइडियली इन आइडियल सेटिंग इंट्रावीनस आयन सप्लीमेंट दैट हेज शोन मेजर बेनिफिट्स now of course we have, we have our old drugs digoxin and diuretics prusamide and digoxin but they don't give the patient any prognostic benefit only for symptomatic benefit but of course diuretics in acute heart failure is a say essential drug actually because without this you can't manage but there's no prognostic benefits so these are high five stuff i am not go, go into more, details but if you you might come across patient with this gadget this is called it's like pacemaker so it's a machine and there are wiring into the heart this is called crt cardiac resynchronization therapy for example certain people with heart failure they have left in ecg if you do ecg you see left bundle branch block with a broad qrs complex this is in addition to heart failure the qrs complex with is matters a lot the patient has broad qrs complex that means the heart is unsynchronized the synchronization is not there that is not good in 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 uh, heart failure patients if you can resynchronize this if you can make this qrs complex narrow then that may be that that will be benefit for the patient in heart failure so you can put this wires and do this is this has been done in our country colombo so uh, you can resynchronize this is called resynchronization you make the qrs complex narrow by putting this gadgets and these are this is not available in our other countries you have machines like assist devices for example left ventricular in left ventricular failure you put up machine you bypass the left ventricle you take the blood from left ventricular apex and this is the pump you pump the blood into the aorta so oxygenated blood is been pumped from left ventricle to the aorta so this is for example if a patient is waiting uh, waiting for a heart transplant to bridge that period you can put this devices right revascularization we know st either stenting or bypass surgery is important in managing heart failure in particular certain uh, people and this is also important cardiac rehabilitation cardiac rehabilitation after heart failure after heart attack or, uh, 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 event of heart failure it's like stroke rehabilitation you can rehabilitate there's a big role in rehabilitation we have actually this is 
this I think I think in 2017 we started this program in our hospital Ratnapura with the uh, help of uh, National Hospital leading uh, with the leadership, uh, leadership with uh, Dr. Sepali Kamendis, I should remember, uh, mention her name also. And they helped us in establishing this cardiac rehabilitation program. We are running this program with a lot of difficulties in our hospital uh, in rehabilitating patients, especially after heart attacks, heart failure. This is important. And uh, little bit on heart failure, preserved ejection fraction. What is preserved? Ejection fraction is normal, but still the patient is having heart failure. How does that uh, happen? Now, certain people, they have diastolic failure. The systolic part is normal. Ejection fraction means that you are measuring the systolic function, not the diastolic. Diastolic is the relaxation. So if the heart can't relax, then again that is part of failure. But ejection fraction, the pumping fu function is normal. So these type of patients, again, they might need, need certain treatment, but at the moment we don't have major treatment as such, but you can consider this. See? Now, this is class 2A, to you know the, 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 uh, the recommendation classes. Class 1 is definitely indicated, and class 2A, there are evidence, and class 2B you can consider, and class 3 means contraindicated, something like that. But there are certain drugs now, uh, ani and other drugs can be used in these patients, but speci especially you have to look into the risk factors. For example, if the patient is in diabetic, you have to control the diabetes properly. Hypertension should be managed very tightly to prevent the patient going into uh, heart failure with uh, reduced ejection fraction. This is in between like. There are certain drugs you should avoid always, try to avoid in heart failure. NSAIDs, COX-2 inhibitors, glitazones, which are not, uh, I mean, very rarely in practice now. Certain uh, glyptins, saxagliptin, these are drugs, cardi certain cardiac drugs and Diltiazem verapamil, common drugs. You should not, you should never give diltiazem verapamil in a patient with heart failure. That can worsen the heart failure. Okay, these are drugs which are contraindicated in heart failure. So summary, in summarize, I, we, we went through the classification, the biomarkers, the medical treatment, and we discussed about ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, spinal lactone group, SGLT2 inhibitors, Iobradine, nitrates, hydralcine, all these are prognostically important prognostic drugs, all these are prognostic drugs and we just went through the CRT, revascularization and of course the, the, the importance of rehabilitation. And uh, before finishing, uh, I, I must take one minute to introduce the cardiac palliative care also. There's an arm called palliation, like cancer palliation certain people unfortunately you do all the all the uh, guideline directed medical therapy but at the end certain people they go into end stage heart failure it's like metastatic cancer there's no curative intent you only the palliation so certain people they go into this this category end stage heart failure where all the prognostic drugs becomes non-essential because you give drugs but no response. So in that situation you tend to omit actually these, these medications. Sometimes you switch off these gadgets also, the electric ones, and uh, you give only the symptomatic drugs. For example, now you can give diuretics uh, and uh, maybe sedation, maybe morphine and something like that in terminal cases. So actually, I have, I, we had a chat actually, you can remember Dr. Kannangara, about uh, pre-COVID era. There's a, there's a little uh, plan with us actually to establish an institute to look after these patients, terminally ill cardiac patients, not available in our country yet. If we can make it happen, I think it will be the first institute in our, we have, we, we, we actually, uh, had a site visit also, Kuruita area, Kuruita CD, 
I think it's a doable thing. We should we should go forward to uh, look after the cardiac um, uh, ill. I mean uh, the terminally ill cardiac patients out of hospital care. It's like uh, a bit of a hybrid care. Medical care is also there. Social support is also there. It's like uh, elderly home. One can visit the place and. Uh, take care of the patient. It, it will be a good model to the country, I think, uh, in this prime, uh, primary care and this, actually this is beyond our tertiary care. So, uh, uh, with that I think uh, I can conclude my talk. I think if you have gained something in managing your patient, that is uh, my pleasure. And if you have any questions, you can ask uh, if you have time. Yes, we have time. If you have any questions, you can ask. And I think uh, it's very, very important to select this topic, the prim primary prevention, I think, as uh, said, it's very important in our country, not for these CRT and hi-fi things, which is practically not viable in our country, but primary prevention. And actually, before that, uh, even before that, primordial prevention. Primordial prevention. What is primordial prevention, by the way? Primary, in, in my case, I see patients, primary prevention means before uh, getting heart attack, to screen the patient. You do full blood count, uh, the fasting blood sugar, lipids, and pick some patients. Hypertension, hypertensive patient, hyperlipidemia, sugar. You treat to prevent heart attack, that is primary. To prevent heart attack, the primary target. So take a secondary means, the patient, once the patient gets heart attack, then you give drugs to prevent the second attack, secondary prevention. What is primordial? Primordial, even without, you prevent the patient going into diabetic state, even pre-diabetes, hypertension, primordial. We can't do it, uh, I mean, alone. So it should be a national, national thing. The, about the diet, air pollution, very, very important now, they have shown air pollution, especially this fuel, uh, in, 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 in cities, has a direct relationship with heart attacks. So be careful if you are in a, living in a city, like this busy city. No, they have shown direct links with air pollution and heart diseases. So these are primordial, we can address. Any questions? Since there are no questions, I think uh, once again I would like to thank the organizers. Wonderful uh, program and uh, I wish you all the best. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, sir. Our next speaker received his primary education at the Royal College of Colombo, following which he carried out his higher studies at the Faculty of Medicine in Colombo and passed out with second class upper honours with distinctions in several subjects and including the Gladys Javardana gold medal for parasitology. He started his professional career as a demonstrator in the department of parasitology in the faculty of medicine Colombo, following which he carried out his internship at the national hospital in Sri Lanka in the year 2007. After which he was attached to the national hospital of Sri Lanka for postgraduate training and prior to engaging in foreign training in United Kingdom at the James Packard University Teaching Hospital. He is held in very high accord at base hospitals Dambulla and District General Hospitals Nuarelia, where he was stationed previously. Yeah. He, is, he holds membership in both the Royal College of Physicians in the United Kingdom and London. He is a member and former assistant treasurer of the Committee and uh, assistant treasurer and committee member of the Sri Lanka College of Dermatologists. He is also a member of the Sri Lanka Association for Advancement of Science, and the Sri Lankan. He, and he is also the Sri Lankan representative for the Tele Dermatology Subcommittee of the South Asian Regional Association of Dermatology, and holds specialist certification in dermatology, uh, awarded by the British Association of Dermatologists and the Royal College of Physicians in London. He has authored over 50 peer review articles in national and international journals. Currently, he is the consultant dermatologist at the base hospital Balangoda.
Today he is here with us to speak about leprosy and the challenges of diagnosing and managing leprosy. Therefore, I cordially invite Dr. Chaturare Sirivardhana to address the gathering. Thank you very much for your kind words and I wish to thank the organizers for inviting me here today for this well organized symposium. So today I decided on this topic on leprosy actually for two reasons. One, as dermatologists, we see that it is uh, quite a challenging condition sometimes to diagnose because it has such a big uh, spectrum of clinical presentations, such a big spectrum of signs and symptoms. Also, the anti-leprosy campaign is trying its best to eradicate this condition but still we do see new patients coming up fairly frequently to our clinics. So as a result, I thought of talking about leprosy. So my topic today is a hypopigmented patch. Could it be leprosy? Challenges in leprosy, diagnosis and management. So I thought I'll start off with a small clinical case. So this picture is of a 13 year old boy who presented with a hypopigmented rash involving his back for six months duration. He had sensory loss to pain and temperature but he had no sensory loss to touch. Could this be leprosy? What do you think? Anyway, I'll discuss about this at the end once you have gained a little bit more insight about the condition. So starting off about leprosy, uh, as you probably are aware, leprosy is, an, is a chronic infection. It's caused by Mycobacterium leprae. Having said that, over the last few years, a new organism also has been identified called Mycobacterium lepromatosis. Uh, both of these organisms are clinically indistinguishable. They are obligate intracellular parasites, so they, they are intracellular organisms, just like Mycobacterium tuberculosis. As a result, our humoral immunity, we have antibodies, you know, they don't have much role in eradicating this organism. So it's the cell-mediated immunity, if you remember the T helper cells, see, tyto, uh, the cytotoxic cells, which help in viral uh, eradication as well as cancer eradication, are the uh, immune system that helps in this system as well. Now, this organism has a predilection for skin adnexial structures and Schwann cells in the nerves. I'll tell what adnexial structures are a little later. Now, the following are clinically relevant actually. Now, this organism prefers a slightly cool environment to thrive. As you know, our body temperature is 36.9 centigrade, but it prefers a slightly cooler temperature of 32 to 34 centigrade. So, as a result, if you see suspicious lesions, for example, in the vault of the armpit or deep into inside the groin or even on the scalp where it's insulated by hair, it's very unlikely to be leprosy because it's a warm environment. It prefers uh, cool areas like the earlobe, nose, external genitalia, etc. and the limbs. Also, it has a very long doubling time. So, for one bacterium to become two, it takes roughly 12 to 14 days. This is in contrast to a common bacterium like E. coli where it divides every half an hour, 20 to 30 minutes. And also it has a very long incubation period which may be as high as 20 years. So once you are infected to develop the disease, it might take as long as 20 years sometimes. So that is why we are very concerned about serial screening of family members. So if you get a patient with leprosy, in addition to screening the family members at that particular time, even after completing treatment, uh, several years later even, family members may develop the disease. So that's why it's very important, especially as primary caregivers, if you find a patient, because they are closest to you all, isn't it? So if you get a patient whose family member has leprosy, it's important just to keep an eye if someone comes with a white patch or something, you need to have a high index of suspicion. Uh, this is only spread by untreated infected humans, so that's one of the reasons we treat them as well. And you must also remember it has a very low infectivity. Only three to, if you take 100 people who get the bacillus inside them, on less than three to five would develop the disease. So it's essentially a disease of peripheral nerves and the skin. Having said that, it can involve any part of the body, 
with the exception of the central nervous system that's the brain and the spinal cord the lower respiratory tract like the lung and the ovaries apart from that any part of the body can be involved so i mentioned before about adnexial structures of the skin can does anyone know what adnexial structures are now you are probably familiar with the uterus we call the ovaries the adnexial structures in the same way adnexial structures are structures which are in close association with the primary structure so in the skin it's the hair follicles oil glands the sebaceous glands the sweat glands nerves the erector pylorus muscle so now when the bacteria lives in this particular areas those are the sites of predilection for da skin damage now you see here i have marked actually uh, i hope you see this circle then cutaneous nerve so cutaneous nerve can be involved the sebaceous gland hair follicle sweat gland and last but not least the melanocyte so when the oil glands are involved the patches become dry and scaly when the nerves are involved it's anesthetic you can lose the hair you can have anhydrosis or loss of sweating and the patch patches can be hypopigmented due to the damage to the melanocytes so it's relatively easy to work out the clinical features it's easy to uh, understand the disease if you think of it as a war a war between the patient's cell mediated immunity and the virulence of the organism and as seen any war there is collateral damage so it's the immune response that damages these structures leading to uh, the symptoms now leprosy as i mentioned before is a spectrum so if you have a very good cell mediated immunity you know our immune system is relatively winning the war so the patches are very few they have a well demarcated margin uh, because they are localized to that area and in this patch if you check there are very few bacilli so in such patients we call them tuberculoid we call it the tuberculoid polar tuberculoid leprosy whereas in contrast when your cell mediated immunity is poor you will have lots of patches ill demarcated margins and we call it Uh, lepromatous leprosy and it's a systemic disease unlike the tuberculosis leprosy you they present with so many symptoms arthritis dermatonephritis testicular atrophy gynecomastia so many things uh, iridocyclitis visual loss so i thought i'll run through, through some pictures so if you have a good good cell mediated immune response the organisms are localized i mean the disease is localized to one or few patches it has a well demarcated margin and due to the excessive damage to the sebaceous or oil glands it can be scaly like in this picture you can notice hair loss in comparison to the surrounding area due to the good inflammatory response it might be red or might have a coppery color and lesions are few in number and this lesion will be anesthetic it will be have a very clear anesthesia now if we are to recall our physiology as a medical student you will you might remember sometimes that uh, you know pain and temperature are carried out in what we call type c fibers right and also a delta fibers which are very fine fibers small nerve endings which are either unmyelinated or have a very thin myelin sheet so these are the nerves that are maximally damaged with leprosy whereas touch and pressure are carried nice thick myelinated fibers so they are less damaged so that's why pain and temperature are first affected now the clinical importance of this is if you see a patient comes and comes to you with a white patch you check with your pen and you don't find a sensory loss don't exclude leprosy straight away right if you have a high index of suspicion you do need to check the temperature as well especially on the face it's very common for sensation to be intact and if you check the temperature you see that in a leprosy patient it has disappeared so these are also tuberculoid leprosy patients with a good immune response they can have a sharp inflammatory margin sometimes hypopigmented patches or plaques also may be seen due to the inflammatory response the nerves also get inflamed you might have thicker nerves in association with the patches i hope you can see the skin patch here near the arrow and the th thick and great auricular nerve and in the foot in association with this patch you can see a thickened 
lateral peroneal nerve. Usually nerves you have to palpate and see, won't, it won't always be visible when it's thickened. So moving down the spectrum, as your cell mediated immunity gets, rest, uh, get le gets less, you find that the patches become, uh, they tend to have less well demarcated margins, there can be small satellite lesions and small like uh, pseudopodia like in the amoeba and the lesion, number of lesions get more and more. And even further down, they are even more less well defined and they are like diffusely infiltrating the skin. So these are, for your level, it's just good enough to call it borderline leprosy. Sometimes patients with borderline leprosy present with this, what we call inverted saucer shaped lesions. That is like when you turn a T saucer the op uh, upside down, you get a central punched out area and sloping margins with a demarcated ring. So these are also features of borderline leprosy. They can be red and scaly, like psoriasis sometimes. So when your cell mediated immune response is very poor, leprosy wins the war. So the leprobacilli are teeming everywhere. They are all over the body with diffuse infiltration of the skin. You might notice there is a flattening of the nasal bridge, loss of eyebrows, which we call madarosis, and small papules and nodules on the skin. And in this gentleman, you, I left this open deliberately, you might notice the white reflex due to cataract. And you can see a uh, smear done on the earlobe here as well. So diffuse infiltration of the earlobes, because it's a relatively cool area. Then the eyebrows, with the loss of the hair, nose, tip of the nose, and the lips are quite visible. But you won't see much, you won't see any discrete separate skin lesions as much. So this is lepromatous leprosy. So some of the dreaded complications which cause significant disability includes digital auto-amputation. Now bear in mind, you know, patients, general public think, now your fingers don't fall off. What happens is due to the neuropathy, you know, they can have a peripheral neuropathy as well as due to the reactions where you get nerve palsies. They have loss of sensation. So the recurrent burns, and tra trauma lead to shortening and resorption of the terminal phalanges and loss of digits. But they won't be falling off. And of course, this is another complication we are due to lack of thalamus. You know, leprosy can involve uh, the facial nerve, so loss of proper closure, eyelid closure, can lead to drying and sc scarring of the cornea with permanent b blindness can have a saddle nose due to the destruction of the cartilage and even the palate. So it can lead to permanent blindness, blindness if not diagnosed. So that's why it's important to treat these patients because they end up being stigmatized and really disabled. So for diagnosis of leprosy, we commonly try to use the cardinal sign, the three cardinal signs of leprosy. So if a uh, suspected person meets any one of these, he can be diagnosed reliably with leprosy. So what are these signs? Let's see. So if you have a suspicious skin patch, either hypopigmented, that's lighter in color, or erythematous, red in color, one or more patches, with a definite loss of sensation, either touch or pain and temperature as we discussed. Or if there is involvement of a peripheral nerve, now bear in mind, just thickening of a nerve doesn't mean anything. Thickening of nerves can be due to so many causes. Can anyone mention a cause of thickened nerves? Anyone? No one. Okay. So you know conditions like even diabetes, acromegaly, HIV, neurofibromatosis, so many conditions. Then hereditary sensory motor neuropathy, Charcot Marie disease like that. But uh, if you get uh, thicker nerve with loss of function, or a irregularly thickened nerve, it's very suspicious of leprosy. Especially irregular thickening of nerve associated with uh, anesthesia or paralysis is leprosy until pro proven otherwise. Even if you don't have this, if you can identify the bacilli either in a smear or a biopsy, then also we can diagnose leprosy. So just to give a brief overview, we broadly divide treatment of leprosy into 
posi bacillary and multi bacillary now this is actually what's done by the who and this is carried out in countries where there are limited dermatology services like for example in india where i have to travel 300 or 400 kilometers to meet a dermatologist or in pacific islanders but in sri lanka we are fortunate we have dermatology services within roughly every 50 kilometers so we don't have to go by this criteria alone we go by the clinical morphology lesion of the lesions as well so sometimes even if it's one lesion if it's suspicious we might consider the treatment for multi bacillary treatment so i'll talk about treatment a little later so either if you have six or more lesions or if there is even one cutaneous nerve involvement or if there is a positive skin smear we have to go for multi bacillary treatment so treatment is issued uh, free of charge so on the left side you will see the adult treatments on the right side for pediatric age groups from 10 to 14 year olds so the la larger number of tablets are seen for multi bacillary treatment which is usually for one year and the lesser tablets number of tablets are seen for posi bacillary treatment which is for six months so below 10 years we have to give the treatment according to the body weight so treatment involves drugs like dapsone which is the white color tablet rifampicin which is given once a month and also clofazimine in multi bacillary treatment so it's like the birth control you know pills you know you go in num num numerical order first day you take all the ones on the top and then you work your way through the blister pack day by day so now leprosy in childhood it's Im important to us for several reasons of course children are the future of the country and the future workforce so if they get disabilities like in this child it has a significant impact but even more so as dermatologists and epidemiologists having children with leprosy the childhood uh, leprosy is very uh, significant to us uh, the reason is now if you get a 50 year old coming with leprosy as i mentioned before he could have acquired it when he was 30 years old 20 years ago right because there's a long incubation period so regarding the leprosy control program we have no idea where we stand because he could have contracted this many years ago he could have contracted this two years ago but in contrast if you get a two year old child with leprosy you can be certain that he developed it within the last two years because that's the period he has been alive so as a result the childhood uh, leprosy uh, you know incidence is very we take that very seriously especially the epidemiologists as well because that gives us an idea about the leprosy control in the country so i'll just briefly talk about reaction so in addition to the disease process per se our immune response also can cause clinical manifestations and a lot of significant complications. So we talk about two types of reactions. Type 1 reaction occurs when our cell immediate immunity suddenly improves for various reasons, maybe the better nutrition or maybe even treatment with drugs. So what happens then? The sudden increase in immunity may lead to the previously thicker nerves getting really inflamed. They can get nerve abscesses you can notice in this patient there's a median nerve abscess over here and an ulnar nerve abscess over here so this can result in sudden acute nerve palsies and if this is not treated immediately either by drainage or with steroids he's going to have a permanently uh, permanent disability with claw hand and if the radial nerve is involved wrist drop like that so in addition to uh, uh, this reversal reaction or type 1 reaction involving the nerves it can also involve pre-existing skin lesions so the previous hypopigmented patch might suddenly swell up turn red and inflamed and become warm showing all the cardinal features of acute inflammation pain tenderness warmth uh, etc so uh, pre-existing skin lesions swelling up is also a feature of type 1 reaction which is a delayed type hypersensitivity reaction Type 2 reaction is what we call erythema nodosum leprosum. You all probably know about erythema nodosum, no? you see in TB and so many other conditions. So it's due to circulating immune complex deposition. So patients will have fever, arthritis, glomerulonephritis, peripheral neuropathy, etc. And they get subcutaneous nodules, just like in erythema nodosum, uh, so commonly on the legs, lower limbs. But unlike erythema nodosum, they can ulcerate they are smaller and they can involve other body areas like the forearms and upper limbs as well and they are more fleeting they change very quickly unlike erythema nodosum 
So both these conditions have to be treated urgently, especially erythema nodosum, leprosum can involve the eye as well, you can get iridocyclitis and even blindness. So now I think this is the part that will more interest you than the previous parts. So if you get a, um, you know, if you are, uh, get any of these conditions, we have to consider leprosy as a differential diagnosis. So patients coming with hypopigmented patches can be leprosy as we saw, raised red patches, deformities, nodules and non-healing ulcers. So due to shortage of time, I'll just deal with the hypopigmented patches and the red patches. So let's quickly run through. So one of the commonest causes of hypopigmented patches in this country is aluha, isn't it? Or uh, what we call pitrosis versicolor. It's due to malassezia infection, which is a yeast. So it produces a chemical called azelaic acid, which bleaches the skin. It's uh, typically, most patients with aluhang say, you know, after a bath, it starts itching. Or if, when you sweat, it starts itching. They might have a family history, and it has a very fine scale. And often, because the organisms grow in the hair follicles, it has a perifollicular involvement, but you can't always appreciate it. So it might occur around a hair follicle, at least in the individual lesions. So uh, that should help us to distinguish that from leprosy. And it's not anesthetic. Now, Petrosis alba is also another common condition we see especially in older children. The typical history you see it is in like in March, April. The child has gone swimming or March past, the band, sports meet. That period they come with these patches. Um, it can also be associated with dry skin and eczema. And usually it's periodic. So every year, March, April they come with it. November, December it goes away. Cooler months and where there is not much sun. So that's very unlikely to be leprosy because leprosy doesn't come and go, come and go like that, you know. So, uh, uh, and the ill-defined nature, the distribution in the sun-exposed areas of the face, association with eczema will help to distinguish. Now, vitiligo. Vitiligo, as you all are <coughs> probably aware, is due to autoimmune destruction of the melanocytes, resulting in reduced melanin. In vitiligo, the skin is usually depigmented. Depigmentation means loss of melanin entirely and the lesion looks pink like in this part over here. Uh, leprosy is usually never depigmented, it's only hypopigmented. Having said that early vitiligo when the lesion is just starting off when all the melanin is not destroyed, it might appear like here, I don't know, you can see the arrow over here. Uh, so You can appreciate this area, it's slightly hypopigmented. I don't know whether it's visible in the picture, but in my computer screen it's visible. You might see the hairs are white, what we call leukotrichia. Unlike the stubble here, which is black, within the lesion you're having white hairs. Now, leprosy never causes white hairs. So that is also a feature of vitiligo. They might have other uh, family members with vitiligo or to a history of thyroid disease among the patient or family members. Those may be features to suspect vitiligo, but in most patients it's fairly straightforward. Then of course another common condition that can be mixed up is tenia. Tenia corporis which or even tenia fasciae, they present with annular scaly patches with well demarcated margins. But there are two features which help us to distinguish. One, tenia is itchy. Now leprosy is usually never itchy. There are very rare exceptions like when uh, resolving reaction, but other than that, it's usually not itchy. Um, so that is one of the most significant features that will help us. Secondly, as you all are probably familiar, uh, tenia involves, you know, armpit, groin, areas which are warm, the scalp, and sweaty. But as I mentioned before, leprosy doesn't occur in those areas because it's the increased temperature. And often they may have a positive history of tenia as well. So these are some more pictures where you might appreciate the active uh, edge. You probably can see it over here. Then in these areas here in the lower margin you can see. And also in the scalp here. But especially when it's treated with steroids, sometimes people by mistake give steroids, topical steroids then it's very difficult because the itching disappears, the margin disappears, so it's a bit difficult there. Polymorphic light eruption is another condition which is fairly common in children where you get this raised 
hypopigmented patches the periphery is hypopigmented central part is hyperpigmented they are quite itchy very itchy actually so that the itching will help to distinguish and it usually occurs after sun exposure so that will help to distinguish this is another fairly common condition actually but uh, often it's mistaken for pertussis versicolor uh, so it's not diagnosed much but it is quite common so it's commonly seen in young adults uh, i hope you can uh, see the picture properly so the typical features are there are discrete hypopigmented macules but when you come to the mid back they all coalesce to form one large hypopigmented area so this distribution is typical of this and unlike aluhang it's not scaly at all so there is no scale it's asymptomatic no itching the exact cause is not known but it is thought due to the propionibacterium acnes in the, uh, the acne causing organism a reaction to that and we usually treat it with antibiotics like benzoyl peroxide clindamycin and phototherapy so um, then this is not as common uh, you get birth marks which can be hypopigmented so this nevus depigmentosus can look like leprosy and they have bizarre margins very sharply demarcated margins serrated margins the main thing to distinguish is that it's present from birth or at least within the first year of life and the bizarre margin those will help to distinguish moving to the red patches and nodules uh, other conditions that move to the differential diagnosis include psoriasis because psoriasis also causes red scaly patches leprosy can cause red, red scaly patches but usually with this degree of leprosy you would have definite sensory loss but psoriasis you won't have sensory loss lesions will be symmetric a little more involved the elbows knees the scalp behind the ear which is again unusual for leprosy and the scale is a typical silvery scale unlike leprosy where it's very dark also they might have nail involvement uh, sometimes arthritis in psoriasis there might be family members which will help to distinguish another thing you might have to distinguish is cutaneous leishmaniasis now leishmaniasis also can involve exposed areas of the body the nose ear lobes again areas involved with leprosy uh, so uh, one some of the features that help us to distinguish is uh, often it's from a endemic area now in the sabaragamo province usually areas like kaltota ambilipitiya those areas it's common and often the patients also come saying allup gedara ekenata veli mesa vidara haduna eka wenna puluwan like that so they are aware in those areas having said that even without living in an endemic area after travel you might develop uh, so uh, here leprosy looks less like less likely for another reason usually leprosy typically involves the yellow because it's cold there but here you can see the central part of the ear which is warmer involved with sparing of this in any case this shouldn't be a problem for differential diagnosis for you all because when you get a patient like this you have to refer because either leishmaniasis or leprosy it, it has to be treated by a dermatologist and a smear will definitely distinguish the two if you do a smear for leishmaniasis you will see the ld bodies the leishman donovan bodies smear for leprosy would be negative whereas in lepromatous leprosy where it involves the yellow you will it will be teeming with acid vas bacilli so these are other lesions of leishmaniasis you can get erosive lesions or even nodules like in this girl's yellow ear over here or erosions or ulcers so moving on to that first patient so probably now with what i said about you can have preserved touch sensation you will notice that this patient has uh ill demarcated hypopigmented patches actually there are several one here there is another one over here i don't know it's very visible i'm sorry the lighting with you can't see it ill demarcated and the vague sensory symptoms this is borderline leprosy so i would probably do a smear and start the patient on treatment so finally as a take home message even if you forget everything else if you just think of this it might help especially when to screen patients for leprosy so you suspect leprosy if someone comes with a skin lesion or a nerve problem with a positive contact history of leprosy or past history of leprosy maybe they didn't take the full treatment or maybe they got reinfected or if a skin lesion has been there for months to years if you have a skin lesion with a hypopigmented patch coming over 3 days that's unlikely to be leprosy 
usually months to years because it takes long time to progress due to the slow doubling time. If the patient is from an endemic area, again in uh, these areas, especially Kalthutta comes to mind, even Balanguda, I am sure there are other areas in the province as well. And in addition to anesthesia and hyposthesia, you can have a complete or partial loss of sensation. Even hyperesthesia, where there is increased sensation, especially in the earlier stage when there is inflammation of the nerve, hyperesthesia is also a feature. Or if there are any cutaneous stigma of leprosy like what we discussed, you know, the leonine faces, loss of eyebrows, uh, saddle nose. Or if there is a trophic ulcer, patient coming with a trophic foot ulcer, not a diabetic. Then again, you should have a high index of suspicion. Could this be leprosy? Because I mean, it's unusual, isn't it? Diabetes is the commonest cause. No diabetes coming with a trophic ulcer. You have to think. And also, loss of motor function of an uncertain cause. Now, if a patient comes to us with face, arm, leg weakness, we know, okay, it's probably a stroke. But if you're coming with just a foot drop without other parts of the body involved, or, you know, if you're having uh, weakness in eye closure, without involvement of the uh, obicul obicularis oris, like in Bell's palsy, if just the eye is involved, again, think, could this be leprosy? And of course, thickened nerves, again, that's an alarm sign whether it could be leprosy. And as I mentioned, leprosy is unlikely if it's itchy or sudden onset of lesions, except with reactions, or involvement of warm areas, like hair-bearing scalp, axillary vault or groin involvement, or if you get a patient coming with significant muscle wasting, say deltoid wasting, with no sensory loss, you know, that is very unlikely to be leprosy. You have to think of other neurological causes first. So, thank you for listening. If there are any questions, I'm, I'll be happy to answer. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir, for that very illuminating speech. Our next speaker graduated from the Faculty of Medicine, University of Ruhuna in 2002 and earned the Doctor of Medicine in Ophthalmology in 2012. He completed further subspecialty training in vitreo retinal surgery, both locally at the National, Hospital, National Eye Hospital of Sri Lanka and overseas as a clinical fellow at the University Hospital of Wales, Cardiff in the United Kingdom and both certified as a consultant vitreo retinal surgeon in the year 2015. He holds the membership of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists in the United Kingdom and fellowship of Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow, United Kingdom and the membership of European Society of vitreo retinal Specialists. He has authored articles in peer-reviewed indexed international ophthalmology journals and presented many papers and posters in both local and international ophthalmology conferences. Currently, he serves as the consultant vitreo retinal surgeon at the teaching hospital Ratnapura. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sanjeeva Kaluarachi to address the gathering. I invite Dr. Uday Bandara to accompany our valued speaker to the stage. Uh, good morning. Uh, nice to see you all today this morning uh, clinical symposium uh, so my uh, presentation today is uh, common eye presentations in the general practice which is uh, most important to all of us in preserving the vision so first of all uh, let's uh, see how the world situation of uh, vision impairment uh, worldwide so it is said that 43 million uh, people are blind worldwide uh, so this is the latest uh, data so, out of the reasons of, for visual impairment, uncorrected refractive errors uh, stands the first uh, in the list, then cataracts, then macular degenerations, then glaucoma, dioptic retinopathy, and the others. So, coming to our region uh, uh, in uh, South, East, South, uh, South Asia, the visual impairment is 18.2 percent, which is the highest uh, in the world. And uh, in our country, uh, there was a national blindness survey done in 2014. It says there is a blindness of 1.7 uh, who are aged more than 40 years. So before going into the subject matter, I uh, just want all of you to uh, remember the, your medical school career days and 
I is considered as the little brain because uh, it has developed uh, So, so this is the familiar picture in embryology days. So I is developed from the uh, f uh, uh, forebrain, the flow of the gland cephalon as optic uh, stalk and optic vesicles. So anything happens in the eye reflects the things happening in the brain. And uh, also it is uh, said that it is the window to the soul because uh, nowhere else in the body we can see the blood vessels uh, uh, lively. So then what are the ophthalmological emergencies uh, we should be aware of? So retinal detachment, they are, it's a potentially blinding condition if not treated. So there are two types of retinal detachment, the macular involved in detachment and the macular spared detachment. So macular, macular spared detachment is the, uh, or the macular on detachment. That means the retinal detachment has not involved the center of the eye. So these people have good prognosis for vision if treated early or the same day surgery. And the next thing is the uh, ocular infection which is called endophthalmitis. And again the preceptal cellulitis in children. That's because that in children they don't have developed the orb orbital septum which limits the infection going into the orbit. So preceptal cellulite should not be neglected in a child. And then orbital cellulitis, the, that is the infection behind the orbital septum. I will come to that later with the pictures. And other things are ocular tra trauma or the globe injuries. It can be either penetrating or perforating or the uh, rupture of the globes. And the next thing is uh, also important, the pupil involved in third nerve palsy, which is called the surgical third nerve palsy because uh, unless proved otherwise we have to exclude the posterior communicating artery aneurysm. And the retrobulbar hemorrhage, that's again after the trauma, the eye will become proptose, very tense uh, with the orbital compartment syndrome, so they will lose the vision if not attended early. And acute angle closure attack and uh, the sudden loss of vision in ischemic optic neuropathy, like in giant cell arthritis and compressive optic neuropathy in thyroid eye disease. So going into the ocular symptoms, uh, I. Uh, I will discuss these things uh, with coming slides uh, uh, in the minute time. So the most important ocular symptoms are floaters and the flashes. So we have to be worried about if they uh, complains of a symptom like floaters and flashes because it might be a, uh, it might be a red flag sign because it might indicate a serious disease at the back of the eye and the red dye tearing, photophobia, those things. We'll come to that later slowly. So then we will first move uh, to the eyelid trauma. When a pa patient comes to you with eyelid trauma, there are th three things we have to be think about or the identify. One thing is uh, the fat, fat tissue at the uh, laceration base. That means the orbital septum has damage because there is fat. Uh, so this is the orbital septum. So which is, which is just the continuation of the periosteum and uh, down it becomes the tarsal plate. Okay, so this limits the uh, anterior part of the skin from the orbital tissues behind. So there is a fat pad behind the orbital septum which might prolapse uh, if the orbital septum is damaged. So then we have to repair the orbital septum. Then the next thing is whether the canalicular damage is there. So the lid lacerations involved in the lacrimal system, we have to repair the canalicular system, otherwise they will uh, uh, end up in tearing for lifetime. Then whether the margin has involved. If the margin has involved, we have to repair the uh, lid margin. So there should be uh, very tight meticulous alignment of the uh, lash line or the gray line behind. So the gray, uh, uh, the gray line is, uh, this is the uh, cross section of the lid. So this is, these are the lashes. So we, we can identify uh, a line co called lash line along the lines of the lashes. And there are uh, meibomian gland orifices behind in the posterior lamella. So in between the lash line, 
and the meibomian gland line we call it the gray line so we have to align the gray line to gray line alignment uh, for the good cosmetic result then the orbital injuries so orbital injuries are very common when people uh, uh, fight so they will get a blow to the face so when they get a blow to the face the force is uh, uh, force goes out from the weakest part of the orbit so the weakest part of the orbit is the orbital floor because there is there is the inferior orbital fissure that's the weakest part and it might fracture and the orbital structures will herniate down to the immediate relation inferiorly uh, that is the maxillary sinus that is called entrapment or the herniation of orbital soft tissues and the muscles so this is the ct scan uh, in the coronal axis so you can see the orbital soft tissues have herniated to the defect down and uh, this CT scan shows the inferior rectus muscle also has entrapped with lot of uh, herniation of the soft tissue down to the maxillary sinus so these all these two cases are indications for the orbital floor repair and uh, this is less severe and this is more severe the other features for you to uh, diagnose orbital uh, flow fractures are you will see infraorbital nerve anesthesia here so or the paresthesia and they can have enophthalmos the eyeball has moved in that's because of the herniation of the soft tissues down to the maxillary sinus and uh, they will have limited eye movement so when we ask the patient to look up he can't look up on the side that's because someone is pulling from down so with the limitation of upward movement those are the features of orbital flow fractures and then coming to the corneal injuries so the this is very common corneal injury a corneal abrasion or the corneal epithelial defect in this patient we have stained the defect with uh, fluorescein and seen under the blue light so we can give antibiotics uh, this will heal on its own within 24 hours time or overnight and this is a, a corneal metallic foreign body so we have to remove these foreign bodies because it will develop siderosis the iron is oxidized and he, they will develop siderosis and this is a cut cornea there is a corneal laceration so we have to repair and this patient has got traumatic cataract as well and this is a extensive corneal laceration with iris tissue prolapse and probably the lens also has gone out and uh, this is a, a scleral rupture with iris prolapse to the bone and this is a very extensive uh, injury which is called a globe rupture it's like spontaneous evisceration so the all ocular tissues has have gone out again the anterior uh, chamber injury so the anterior segment injuries there is a level uh, blood in the anterior chamber which is called high femur and there is a diffuse high femur involving the whole anterior chamber of the eye and this is a diffuse subconjunctival bleed so we have to be worried about in these uh, uh, kind of patients because they will have hidden scleral ruptured under the blood clots so we have to check the intraocular pressure to see whether there is a good globe contour or the integrity and this again is a small subconjunctival hemorrhage so these subconjunctival hemorrhages are very common in blunt traumas so they will disappear on its own within about 10 days time uh, actually we don't need to treat these uh, small subconjunctival bleeds because it will be absorbed later on the next thing is any ocular injury uh, suspect intraocular foreign bodies uh, unless proved otherwise because uh, there, there will be a small injury where uh, there is a small iris defect here so that that indicates there is an intraocular foreign body so this is the tract of the intraocular foreign body or the tra trajectory uh, to go the intraocular foreign body through the corneal penetration so because if these if we don't diagnose and left unattended these patients will end up in blindness because iron foreign bodies are very toxic so there is photoreceptor degeneration and they will end up in blindness with the siderosis so these are few cases of uh, my patients uh, 
when, when I was in Kodunagal. Fortunately, uh, I didn't get any intraocular for thin body in Sabaragamu area up to now. So, good sign. So, that means people are very uh, uh, self care is there in protecting their eyes. Maybe less industrialized compared to the northwestern province. So, these are sometimes kinds of uh, metallic foreign bodies you can see in the CT scan here. And uh, one here, large one. So, this is uh, another intraocular foreign body. Uh, very uh, interesting case for us, but not to the patient. So this foreign body has gone and ended up with the optic nerve. It has traversed through the cornea, gone through the lens and the vitreous. Then it has pierced the posterior part of the globe and ended up in the optic nerve. So I have published this case uh, in a lot of international con uh, conferences. And other thing is, uh, the, some foreign bodies are not that toxic when compared with the metallic foreign bodies because the glasses and sand, they are considered as inert. So sometimes if there are no any complications, we can just leave them up uh, considering the risk and the benefit of the surgery. The iron foreign bodies cause siderosis with photoreceptor toxicity and blindness. And copper foreign bodies, they are very toxic. So that is called chalcosis. So they will, uh, their clinical picture resembles like endophthalmitis. Then the periocular infections. So this is a case of preceptal cellulitis. That is the infection in front of the orbital septum. In children, we have to be worried about because they don't have the orbital septum developed. So this infection will fastly move on to the, uh, or to cause orbital cellulitis. So we have to treat them uh, early with antibiotics, probably IV antibiotics. So this is orbital cellulitis, uh, there is uh, proptosis, very tense lid edema and uh, limited eye movement, we call it ophthalmoplegia. So elevation has restricted, uh, the adduction has restricted. So when we do a CT scan, we can see the ethmoidal sinuses have uh, filled with infection and there is a subperiosteal abscess. This is very common presentation of orbital abscess, so we have to drain the subperiosteal abscess to preserve their vision. You can see the optic nerve also has kink because of the uh, volume effect. So it might cause a orbital compartment syndrome as well. So we treat with IV antibiotics and uh, do the necessary treatment after the neuroimaging. So this is again another periocular infection called dactyocystitis. So it's the infection of the lacrimal sac of the uh, tear drainage pathway or the lacrimal canalicular system. So this is very important because you can see the swelling is, the, fun, the top of the swelling is just above the medial canthus level. So that is the normal anatomy of the lacrimal sac where the fundus of the uh, lacrimal sac is just above the medial canthus. If there are lumps just uh, at the si uh, level of the medial canthus, that, that is dactyocystitis. If there are lumps somewhere here, maybe dermoids also. And uh, these are the lid infections. So this is the cross section of the lid. And the lid has two parts. So this is called anterior lamella, where there is orbicular is ocular muscle, subcutaneous tissue at the la lashes. This is called anterior lamella. And the tarsal plate with the meibomian glands is called the posterior lamella. So the, what we commonly know as styes. So they involve the glands, ciliary glands here. They are called either glands of size or glands of mole. That causes uh, sty. Uh, sty is, a, uh, another name for sty is external hodiolum. So it's very painful because uh, there is abscess in a very uh, tense or tight uh, subcutaneous tissue. And uh, so it's in the anterior lamella. Sometimes you will get lumps somewhere here something like that. So they, it's not in the lid margin, it's just above the lid margin. So that is called calation. That is the inflammation and the infection of meibomian glands in this tarsal plate. So this is a sty or the external hodiolum. This is a calation. So it's above the lid margin or the internal hodiolum. 
so this is how we uh, drain the uh, calcium. So we can, you also can do at your general practice even if you have some uh, uh, exposure, uh, you have to get the calcium forceps, make a vertical incision, and do some curettage and remove the uh, necrotic matter out. So this is again a very common presentation in our general practice, the herpes zoster ophthalmicus. So you can see uh, blisters. So they are centripetal because uh, they start from the center and uh, differentiate towards the periphery. So centripetal distribution. And the lid edema, this is called blepharoconjunctivitis. So lid edema and the conjunctivitis. And this is a very important sign which is called Hutchison sign. So this area is called the LA of the nose and the tip of the nose. This area is supplied by the external nasal nerve, which is a branch of nasociliary nerve, which comes from the ophthalmic uh, division. So nasociliary nerve is the sole sensory supply to the eye. So if the tip of the nose or the alley of the nose involved, that means there is invariably uh, eye involvement is there. So we have to see the back of the eye as well to see any retinitis even. So we can treat these patients with uh, uh, oral acyclovir, some antibiotics to prevent the secondary infection, and uh, acyclovir ointment also five times a day. So this is a corneal infection with, with the uh, herpes simplex virus. This is called dendritic epithelial keratitis. So dendritic means uh, our the corneal nerves, they have a uh, division. Uh, they always divide into two parts like this. It's like a branch of a tree. That's why there is characteristic appearance of a dendrite. That's why it's called a dendritic ulcer. So we have to uh, stain uh, and see under the blue light. So if the dendritic ulcer is not treat, treated and unattended, it will end up with the geographic epithelial defects. So this is called geographic at, uh, ulcer. And this will start with pseudodendrites-like appearance. So again, we can uh, treat them with uh, uh, antiviral drugs. Then again, the ophthalmia neonatarum. So that, that is the infection of a newborn, the conjunctivitis, very severe infection, which has acquired from the birth canal, contamination from the birth canal. So the infection occurs within first month of life. So in these children, the organisms are uh, gonococci, or the chlamydia, the E. coli, hemophilus, those are the organisms. Out of this, the gonococci is the most severe or, and virulent organism because it can penetrate the intact epithelium. No organisms will penetrate the intact epithelium, even in trauma, but neisseria, they can penetrate the intact epithelium and very uh, uh, severe conjunctivitis. So we have to do corneal scrapings, corneal uh, uh, SOPs uh, for the microbiology and treat accordingly. So then it's, uh, this is the commonest presentation, the conjunctivitis. So conjunctivitis may be either bacterial, viral, or the protozoal uh, and fungal, some, and uh, so like that. So this is a case of bacterial conjunctivitis, where are, the conjunctiva is very beef red in color, and lot of discharges are there, the crust here. So it's very severe infection. This is very angry looking eye in bacterial conjunctivitis. Compared to the bacterial conjunctivitis, viral conjunctivitis is called the pink eye. So there is less severe infection, and the conjunctiva is uh, pink in color, and uh, this is actually called uh, uh, sore eyes. They feel some gritty feeling in the eye. This is viral infection, viral conjunctivitis. So the, the, the patients with the viral conjunctivitis, they will later develop a condition called keratitis. So if they develop keratitis, we call it keratoconjunctivitis. So adenovirus is a common organism which can cause keratoconjunctivitis. And uh, this condition, there is conjunctivitis and there is a membrane here in the uh, lower subtarsal conjunctiva which is called a pseudomembrane. Sometimes we have to remove the, this pseudomembrane uh, to uh, get the conjunctivitis resolved. So what are the causes for painful red dye? So in a patient present you with a painful red dye, so one thing is acute angle closure attack, then they might have uveitis, corneal ulcers, 
and uh, maybe sclerosis or episclerosis, then ocular infection called endophthalmitis, or the traumatic corneal injuries with corneal foreign bodies. And sometimes, uh, if they if they have very mature cataract, the cataract lens proteins will come into the anterior chamber and induce uveitis, which is called phacolytic glaucoma or phacomorphic glaucoma. These are the causes for uh, painful red dye. So this is a corneal uh, infection, the infective corneal keratitis. So the white uh, level in the anterior chamber is called the hypopion, and there are white fluffy uh, area, so very severe bacterial infection. And uh, this is actually called a ring abscess. This is very common in contact lens wearers, uh, very painful uh, ring abscess. And this is a fungal uh, infective keratitis, where there are feathery edges and some greasy appearance and hypopion, and there might be some satellite lesions also. This is an appearance of fungal infection. These are very common in our countries because people do farming, and our country is a very temperate country and good uh, environment for the fungal growth on some vegetative matter. So, if, so we have to take a history so to uh, see how they have got the infection and treat accordingly. So, so don't ever use steroids in this uh, set of patients because that will ruin uh, their eyes and they will lose, lose the vision. Sometimes we have to remove the eye if it is not uh, responding. So don't ever treat with steroids. You can treat with uh, frequent antibiotics because uh, in, in, in military also, if we want to capture some area, we have to do uh, frequent bombardment, isn't it? So the same practice has to be applied here. We have to treat with more frequent antibiotics, maybe quarter hourly or maybe half hourly to get the minimum inhibitory concentration to kill the organisms. So this is a uh, pathophysiology of an acute angle closure attack. So the pupil has gone and stuck into the lens. The aqueous produced from the ciliary body is accumulated behind the iris, and it pushes the iris and closes the uh, iridocorneal angle. So this is the mechanism uh, which happens in uh, acute angle closure attack. So when we get the patient, they are in severe pain, headaches. Sometimes they will end up in medical wards or the neurosurgery wards or the surgical wards, maybe the, because of the headache. So we, you have to identify. There are, there are triad of symptoms. They will come with the painful red dye and mid-dilated pupil. And they are in severe pain. And if you check the pressure, it's very high and with the corneal haze and the poor vision. So we have to treat them uh, urgently with uh, IV mannitol and IV diamox is available and uh, give some pilocarpine and refer uh, to a uh, eye center as soon as possible to get the, to preserve the vision. Because if their pressure, eye pressure goes above 50, there are this invariably, there are this uh, central retinal artery occlusion and they will lose the vision. So this is, these are the pictures of endophthalmitis. So endophthalmitis can be either exogenous. So we have to introduce the organism from outside. The commonest reason is the post-surgical or the trauma. Maybe endogenous. So the organisms have come, with, come from within the body. So the, the people who are immunocompromised have long cannulas and CVP lines, femoral lines, uh, people with chronic liver disease, pyelonephritis, they will get endogenous endophthalmitis. So in this case, there's a corneal abscess from the entry bone into the eye, and there is hypopion. And here again, there is hypopion, the acutely red dye, painful red dye with poor vision. So the, this is a patient after the cataract operation. There's a lens you can see. So we have to identify and refer. So this is a case of uh, endogenous endophthalmitis. Actually, a candida endogenous endophthalmitis. I have published this one. Uh, a few years back, during the COVID time, this patient was immunosuppressed uh, and recovered from COVID uh, pneumonia. And uh, after about 10 days, she presented to me with uh, blurred vision. And on examination, there are white fluffy lesions. They are fungal balls, the candida, in the retina, and a lot of vitritis. So then I did the vitreous aspirate and removed the inflamed vitreous, so we could identify uh, candida organisms, the body in organisms here. So we treated with uh, intravitreal amphotericin and IV amphotericin, the patient recovered. Actually now she has uh, 6 to 12 vision in that eye. So the next thing is painful red dye, uveitis. So you will see uh, 
dilated blood vessels. These are ciliary blood vessels. They are radially oriented, like the corona radiation of a, a sun. So they are radially oriented, dilated blood vessels. This is called ciliary ingestion in uveitis. And you will see that their pupil is irregular because of the pupil has gone and stuck into the lens, which is called posterior synechia. And they have, uh, this is called keratic precipitates. The iris pigments, pigmented, pigments have deposited on the endothelium. And there is inflammatory exudates in the anterior chamber. So it may be either infectious, inflammatory, and uh, maybe vasculitis, uh, the, and uh, it may be idiopathic sometimes. So this is a case of cataract induced uveitis, hazy cornea with mature cataract, and they have uh, uh, large giant keratic precipitates. So giant keratic precipitates are because of the, uh, maybe because of the tuberculosis, the leprosy, and sarcoidosis, uh, maybe endophthalmitis, so which is called granulomatous inflammation. So if we see these giant keratic precipitates, we have to investigate for granulomatous inflammation in the eye. So this is a case of uh, toxo, uh, first one. So white fluffy lesion, very common. Toxoplasma retinochoriditis. They also present with uveitis and poor vision. Uh, very common uh, because almost all people have cats at their home. Uh, the contamination, fecal contamination, they will end up with uh, toxoplasma lesion in the retina. And uh, this is a case of sarcoidosis. Uh, there's a sarcoid granuloma. This is also, again, my patient in uh, and this is called candle wax dripping. The, there are this perivasculitis along the veins uh, in sarcoidosis, characteristic appearance. So what are the causes for sudden loss of vision? As we are aware, the retinal detachment, the vitreous hemorrhage, the artery and vein occlusions, the traumatic optic neuropathy and ischemic optic neuropathy, those are the causes for sudden loss of vision. So this is a case of uh, central retinal artery occlusion, very pale looking uh, fundus, and this is called the cherry red spot, because all the other areas are, areas are edematous and pale looking, the center, which is the thinnest area in the retina, is uh, contrasted. That's why we call it a, it a cherry red spot. So central retinal artery occlusion is, should be considered as, as a mini stroke, because uh, it's a uh, artery occlusion. So if we neglect this, the patient will uh, end up in a massive stroke. So these are the vein occlusions. This one is a ischemic, uh, very aggressive central retinal vein occlusion. This is a branch uh, retinal vein occlusion. So the hypertension and the diabetes are and hyperlipidemia are the commonest causes, uh, risk factors. So this is a case of retinal detachment. You can see the retina has detached and there's a large tear. And uh, this is a macula on detachment. The macula has not yet involved. So this set of people have good prognosis after the surgery. These also have good prognosis, but uh, their vision may be 6, 9 or 6, 12 if we do the operations early. Uh, if, the, if we delay, they have also poor vision even if we get achieve the technically good success. So we have to refer patients as soon as possible. So our policy is we operate retinal detachment on the same day, the macula on detachment and the macula off detachment, we operate at the same day if time permits or the following day. So we give them priority as red flag cases. So if you find these people, refer to us, so we operate. So this is a case of anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. There is uh, disc edema and uh, hemorrhages uh, in the peripapillary area, uh, dilated blood vessels. So uh, very important because uh, people will present, especially the old age people, they will present with jaw claudication. They have uh, pain on the masseter area, on uh, eating, chewing, and they have temporal headache and uh, tenderness of the temporal headache. Some people might complain they can sleep on that side, they can't comb the hair. So they might give a history of transient obscuration of the vision. So we have to suspect and do ESR, uh, full blood count those investigations. And uh, we have to have a high level of suspicion to prevent them going blind. 
So the floaters and flashes is a very common symptom that is because of the aging process. So we have a, a vitreous deli at the back. With the aging process, this vitreous degenerates. So this vitreous, uh, they lack the jelly structure and become a liquid. Initially, there are fluid-filled uh, cysts appearing in the middle of the vitreous, and they coalesce to form a big uh, lacunae of uh, fluid here, and ultimately it detaches from the uh, attached retina. So this is very dangerous because some parts of the uh, vitreous is still attached to the retina. When it detaches, it will exert uh, some traction on the retina. So when they get the traction, that will stimulate the photoreceptors. So that's why they uh, complain flashes, the flickers of light from here. Some people say uh, lightning-like thing. Uh, that is because of the dynamic traction on the retina. So these areas have still not detached, remain attached, exerting traction. So this is a case of fully detached vitreous. This is called posterior vitreous detachment. It's the natural process of the aging. So coming to the diabetic retinopathy, three things, uh, pathological changes you have to uh, uh, remind, that is uh, basement membrane thickening, uh, the pericyte loss, and the endothelial cell proliferation. If you uh, go on these things, you can uh, outline all the changes of the diabetic retinopathy, because uh, they, they, this is a microvascular disease, their capillary integrity is lost, and there is leakage, weakening of the vessel wall can cause microaneurysms and they might rupture and bleed, then they will develop retinal hemorrhages. All those things can be explained if you know the basic pathological changes. So diabetic, uh, there are two major types. One is non-proliferative diabetic and the proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So we have to identify people at this stage at least. So there are a lot of venous changes, leakage, retinal hemorrhages, still we can't find any new vessels. So these, that's why we call them non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So if, we, if you uh, detect patients with non-proliferative uh, diabetic retinopathy, so check their control of the blood sugar and uh, screen for the nephropathy also because that's again is a microvascular uh, complication. So when it goes further, they will get neovascularization process and they will get have uh, uh, vitreous hemorrhage, the preretinal bleeds, new vessels, and this is a lasered eye. So at this stage, uh, we have to uh, uh, intervene them and uh, to preserve their vision. These are very advanced cases of diabetic retinopathy. Here there is a vitreous hemorrhage and uh, tractional retinal detachment with sort of fibrovascular proliferation. So when we come to this stage, they, will, they have to have surgery to preserve the vision. At this stage, we, can, we can't get the vision back. So what we do is the preserve uh, the vision. So this is diabetic maculedema. That's again is the microvascular leakage. There is a cell in uh, uh, fluid in the foveal area. So they will have poor vision with some exudates uh, in the center. So this is a laser eye, so if we do a good laser and good dot job, we can preserve this patient's vision. So most important thing is to identify and refer. So what are the screening criteria? In type 2 diabetic uh, people, we have you to uh, see them, uh, screen them at the time of diagnosis. Type 1 uh, people or the children, we can see them either 10 years of age or 5 years after the diagnosis or whichever occurs earlier. So the in diabetes in pregnancy, gestation, if there is a pure gestational diabetic, uh, gestational diabetes mellitus, actually we don't have to see them. And if there is a pre-existing diabetes uh, in pregnancy, we have to see them in each trimester. And this is the red and white reflex in uh, neonates. So you can get hold of ophthalmoscope and uh, see about a feet distance, you will see the red reflex is if there is no any media opacity. If there is a media opacity like retinal detachment, retinal, retinoblastoma or congenital cataract, you will see white reflex like this. So then the glaucoma. So glaucoma again is a, a chronic progressive optic neuropathy. Uh, there is a rule called ISN theory because uh, this, this is the optic disc, this is the optic cup. Usually this optic cup is horizontally oval. That means 
in normal population they have inferior and superior nerve uh, neuroretinal rim this is called the neuroretinal rim hole area they are thickened because lot of no nerves are entering the disc from inferior and superiorly that's why they are the rim is thickened so the in glaucoma this uh, appearance reverses what happens is the optic cup become vertically oval like this like this so that is glaucoma uh, with, and the damage is somewhere here is called we, we actually uh, don't know what's the reason for glaucoma so maybe uh, the mechanical damage the mechanical stress at the level of the neuroretinal rim superiorly and inferiorly first initially so the cup enlarges it becomes vertically oval so these are the visual field defects in glaucoma so this is the fiber arrangement of the uh, retina the nerve fibers are arranged like this the superior fibers and the inferior fibers they don't cross the midline so if we consider this area the fibers from whole area are entered from the from here the superiorly uh, is like a bundle they enter the optic disc like a bundle if you get the damage here the whole area you will lose the vision so this is called the arcuate type of visual field defects or the nerve fiber bundle defect so that we, we can see there is a notch damage here superiorly so we will get the visual field defects upside down the inferior arcuate type of visual field defect so this is very advanced glaucoma so this stage uh, advanced cupping is there and you will have the tunnel vision it's like uh, looking through a tunnel like this so we can't see the periphery of the vision in these people so these are the two main types of visual field defects so this is called altitudinal field defect so the superior half or the inferior half has involved so these type of visual, visual field defects are vascular in origin so there might be a vascular occlusion like anterior ischemic optic neuropathy they will get altitudinal field defect so this is the field defect of is uh, of neurological disorders these are called hemianopic defects so this is neurological in origin this is vascular in origin and this is a field defect by temporal hemianopia in uh, suprasellar masses so there is a mass here suprasellar mass so by temporal hemianopia so other uh, common complication is uh, whether the neon children come in with parents they are worried about the uh, skin so you can just flash a light uh, about uh, one feet distance without disturbing their visual axis somewhere down here then you will get the reflection of the light in the center of the pupil this is normal so actually we can assess the deviation uh, according to the position of the uh, light reflex in the eye so if it is at the pupil margin 15 degree deviation is there the eye has turned either inward or outward so likewise we can just quantify the deviation so this is called esotropia or the convergent skin the eye has moved in this is a exotropia the eye has moved out so we have to identify these children early so and this is the normal Hirschberg reflex the the reflexes are at the center of the pupil so this is a paralytic skin uh, you can see the patients can't so see the left side so this is six nerve palsy isolated six nerve palsy and this is third nerve palsy so you patient has elevation defect adduction uh, adduction defect and depression weakness in these people check the pupils whether they have mid dilated pupil to exclude the surgical third nerve palsy so this is fourth nerve palsy so people have uh, down down gaze diplopia and they they tend to keep their head tilted like this to get rid of the diplopia so there is uh, elevation of the affected side when the head is tilted so this is the seventh nerve palsy this is called lagophthalmos so we have to protect the cornea so we have to give frequent lubrication the tear supplements and if it if there is no Bell's phenomenon because we all know there is a kind of thing called Bell's phenomenon when the eye closes the eyeball moves up there are some people who don't have Bell's phenomenon so they will get exposure keratopathy so we have to preserve the cornea with frequent lubrication sometimes we have to put a stitch which is called tarsopathy to protect the cornea 
So this is how you check for the pupil light reflex, very important clinical sign. So if you flash the light, the both sides should constrict. That is the normal. So if you uh, flash light, if the pupil remain dilated, that means the afferent uh, pathway defect. That is called RAPD. So the differential diagnosis of mid-dilated pupil, we have come across all things, the acute angle closure glaucoma, third nerve palsy. There's a condition called EDS pupil. Uh, you can read that. That is a denervation hypersensitivity at the level of the ciliary ganglion. And traumatic midriasis, even trauma can cause sphincter ruptures. So they will have mid-dilated pupil and maybe iatrogenic after the surgery. So these are the uh, screening criteria for uh, retinopathy of prematurity in uh, College of Ophthalmologists. Uh, this is available in the website, so you can go through if you want. So any child uh, born less than 32 weeks and birth 8,500 grams has to be referred, or any premature sick child, uh, we have to see for ROP. Now, uh, no one is going blind because of ROP compared to about 15 years ago. So our screening program has very effective in identifying and treating uh, children with retinopathy of prematurity. So this is just to know the visual development in children. At six weeks, they can have fixation and following. They, they just smile with their mother. That is called responsive smiling. So that is six weeks. That is normal. And at three months, they can fix and follow objects. And six, at six months, they can reach for the objects. And two years, they can have some picture matching ability. So this is the normal visual development in children. We can roughly assess in the, our general practice uh, the visual assessment. And coming to uh, my specialty, these are vitreoretinal diseases. So this is called a macular hole. There is a full thickness defect in the center of the macula. So we can see uh, in this uh, OCT image. So we can treat them. We can get the vision back, maybe not perfect. But if we do early surgery, we can get the vision back and preserve the vision. So they will uh, come to you with some distortion of the vision. Sometimes they will say they, th they see the straight lines of the road like wavy or some areas they have uh, uh, lost the line in the middle. So that is because uh, there is no focusing ability at the macula. There is a hole. There is no retina there. And this is the epiretinal membrane, the scarring process on the surface of the inner retina. And this is the vitreomacular traction. So we can treat these things now uh, and preserve the vision. Thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, okay, I can answer. Pterygium actually uh, is, is because of uh, uh, chronic exposure uh, to the incoming wind and the, uh, uh, they, they are in uh, chronic exposure to the sunlight. So when the wind comes and hit on your face, it goes like this. So there is some degeneration at the level of the corneal limbus. They are called stem cells. Uh, so these stem cells, they prevent the growth of the conjunctiva towards the cornea. So that is called a pterygium. So if there is no any symptoms, we can just leave them. Uh, also, you can give some tear supplements to uh, make them uh, some, uh, some kind of reassurance. And if the pterygium is very large and it comes to the center of the cornea, uh, obscuring the visual axis, poor vision, and sometimes uh, before the cataract operation, we have to take corneal measurements, no, that which is called corneal reading, so that will uh, interrupt with the corneal measurements. So those are the two indications where we remove the pterygium. So otherwise if it is small and uh, if no complaints, we can leave it alone. So it's not harmful, not a cancer. Thank you very much, sir, for that most educating speech. Our next speaker graduated with an MBBS from the Faculty of Medicine, Colombo, and qualified in an MD in the Family Medicine by clinical training and examination from the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, Colombo. After she, com uh, she completed her overseas training in the Family Medicine at 
Department of General Practice, Western Sydney University in Australia. Returning to the country, she is currently serving as the consultant family physician at the base hospital Varakapala. It is my pleasure to invite Dr. Shalini Fernando to address the gathering. And I invite Dr. Namal Kasturi Arachi to accompany her to the stage. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's almost uh, afternoon. And <coughs> uh, if I say uh, pri strong primary care is the backbone of a healthy health system, you all agree with me. So in my talk, I'm trying to take you to another dimension in primary care, that is chronic disease management. Because um, uh, uh, as primary care physicians, uh, the majority of what we see are chronic diseases. And my talk will be mainly focused on how person-centered, on evidence-based, uh, person-centered um, strategies can be adopted for more effective chronic ma disease management in primary care. So, um, this is the presentation overview. Um, very briefly, I'll talk about chronic disease burden to uh, the health sector and the impact of person-centeredness on chronic disease management, what benefits we can achieve. And also incorporating uh, how to incorporate some of the person-centered approaches in uh, common chronic diseases that we encounter day to day uh, in primary care. It's quite um, much of evidence-based. So what are chronic diseases? Chronic diseases are long-term conditions the generally recommend, uh, regarded as conditions lasting for more than three months. Uh, different uh, institutions actually they define the uh, in their definitions the time scales are different for chronic diseases uh, and mostly these are non-communicable diseases and uh, such as you know like cardiovascular disease diabetes cancer chronic respiratory disease malignancy and the list goes on Though the conditions are different, they all share a very common uh, feature that is the long-standing physical, psychosocial and economic consequences very badly affecting uh, the, the, the patient, their family, community and the country as a whole. And also these conditions have a huge impact on the quality of life of the affected and the family. So these conditions are not curable that we know, but they can be prevented in all levels of prevention. Uh, in the morning, you, you all uh, heard the levels of prevention. So, and also these conditions are controllable. Chronic diseases actually is a very huge burden to the health of global and local health sectors and of course it is can be considered as an epidemic and the numbers are continue to rise uh, non communicable diseases of course uh, can be considered as the number one killer in the world cardiovascular diseases becoming the commonest cause and very sadly majority of non communicable disease deaths uh, in low and middle income countries. So, uh, if we look at the Sri Lankan statistics, a very recent study has uh, declared that um, in Sri Lanka, every one in three adults uh, have hypertension and they are on treatment. And also, uh, there's a large population of adults live with diabetes. And diabetes is the leading risk factor for disability in, uh, Sri Lanka, among Sri Lankan adults. So what is the place of primary care in the management of chronic diseases? We have evidence from our own continent. The, the chronic diseases can be managed very effectively, making primary care as the front line. So this is a study done in rural China and published in 2022 that uh, we can, they, can, they achieved actually uh, very good promising results uh, by 
managing chronic diseases in primary care with better medication adherence. Uh, so they are, their conditions are very well controlled with fewer specialist visits as, as well as uh, inpatient admissions and also uh, finally a lower medical spending. Uh, so there are no two words that primary care is the best place uh, to have the, the first line care of chronic diseases. So what is person-centered care? This is the core of my presentation. Person-centered care is actually uh, an appro approach to patient care uh, where the patients are recognized as individuals and they are, they are encouraged to play an active role in making decisions about their care and also uh, uh, their valid needs and their preferences are understood and well respected by the care provider. So the person-centered care is well known to have good clinical and cost benefits because patient-centered care honors and respects patients' choices. So patients get a dignity that the patient was valued, patients' uh, needs are valued. And, it, and also patient is a part of the decision-making team. So it improves patient's adherence because most of the decisions are taken according to patient's circumstances. And also by uh, handing over the responsibility and uh, giving uh, person-centered information, they get empowered and they are, they, their engagement in their self-care can be well achieved. So finally, uh, this improves health in its all dimensions and also the quality of life of uh, the person affected and as well as their carers. So in, in by and large, uh, this gives uh, good clinical results as well as cost benefits um, at the end of the day. So having said that, let's see how some of these person-centered approaches through evidence that can be uh, adopted into um, the management of common chronic diseases. So hypertension is one. Um, hypertension is a very common condition that we all see day every day. And uh, what about the timing of antihypertensive medication? What is the best time, morning or evening? Any guesses? This is a very uh, common question also people come and ask, Dr. May, pressure pet the bond one one of the kela. So how do you advise? Does it really matter? So um, about half a decade ago, actually the school of thought was uh, taking antihypertensives in the night would give better cardiovascular outcomes. Uh, but recently, after a large clinical trial, the evidence has changed. This was a randomized controlled trial done in the UK. It's called the TIME study. It was uh, published, the results were published in October 2022. Uh, time stands for timing of antihypertensives morning versus evening. And um, I'll tell you a bit details about this study. This is a prospective open labeled parallel group study with blinded endpoints. And uh, actually it has, uh, it, the participants were more than 24,000 adults on at least one antihypertensive, they are regular antihypertensives, randomly assigned to one in, on one-to-one -one basis to morning and after evening groups. And uh, the composite endpoints uh, looked for were vascular death, non-fatal MI, and non-fatal stroke. And the, both the groups were followed up average 5.2 years. The results are very interesting. At the end of the follow-up period, the authors found out that there's no clinically significant change in primary endpoints in both in, in both in morning versus evening group. So the authors conclude evening dosing of usual antihypertensive medication was not different from morning dosing in terms of major cardiovascular outcomes. And they recommend patients can be advised that they can take their antihypertensives uh, at whatever the time they wish, to, even morning or evening, um, according to their um, 
preference and uh, that ensures uh, adherence as well as minimizes any undesirable effects. So this is really good news as family primary care physicians that we, all, we can uh, advise our patients, we can actually, we can convey our patients that they can choose the timing of the antihypertensive according to their lifestyle, uh, maybe their um, family dynamics or whatever. So definitely it, it will improve uh, their adherence and then uh, by then their the clinical outcomes. So let's see how person-centeredness can be incorporated in diabetes care. There had been quite a revolutionary change in diabetes care in the recent past uh, with um, more uh, new uh, anti-diabetic medication coming into the picture. Sodium glucose co-transporter inhibitor is one of them. And uh, I would like to share this evidence summary with you. Uh, this is actually a very latest evidence summary published by the American Diabetes Association in the year 2022. And uh, according to that evidence, for type 2 diabetes, first line therapy is uh, decided according to the patient's treatment needs and management requirements. And usually it still remains metformin along with comprehensive lifestyle uh, modification uh, based on very strong evidence and the recommendations are a, a grade rep strongly recommended. And uh, it's, it gives also a very interesting evidence on sodium glucose co-transport inhibitor as well. Uh, that this agent actually can be um, added, uh, can be used as an early add-on therapy rather than going, rather than like, you know, following the conventional uh, second line add-on therapy. This can be introduced early on a patient's uh, treatment protocol when if they have like established cardiovascular diseases or uh, there's, a high, there's a risk of cardiovascular diseases or else heart failure or reduced renal function. And that is also based on strong, um, good quality evidence and the recommendations are grade A. So knowing the, and uh, this is of course is a risk benefit profile of uh, commonly used oral hypoglycemic agents in our country. Actually other countries use some other agents as well, but uh, we are not like, our, we are not uh, financially strong enough to use them in our primary care. So these are the, these are the drugs uh, that are realistically we can use. So if you uh, concentrate on the SGLT2 inhibitors, you will see that uh, it doesn't have any hypoglycemic effects. If you can remember uh, at the heart failure lecture also, uh, the cardiologist said that it doesn't have any hypo effects. And also, uh, apart from that, it has benefits in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and heart failure as well as in uh, patients with re reduced renal effects. Um, but their glucose lowering um, effect can be reduced in very, if the EGFR is very low. And most importantly, uh, if you look for any weight loss benefit, of course, they offer, the, um, offer that as well. So, uh, so um, in treating type 2 diabetes mellitus, metformin still secures its place as the first line as long as it is tolerated. But if you think, are thinking of a second line choice, so SGLT2 inhibitors are there, provided uh, the patient's CVD risk stratification, renal compromise, weight benefits, patient's preferences, and affordability because this drug is quite costly. And um, on the other hand, if the patients, I mean, like if, if patients, are, uh, patients can afford, uh, this would be a good choice. But person-centeredness means the pa pa patients 
um, actually patient's preference and they are respecting their needs and their um, uh, affordability. So if cost is a concern, and uh, pro uh, cost is a concern while uh, they don't need any uh, cardiovascular or renal benefits as well as uh, there's no problem in the weight, then always the conventional um, second line drugs, the sulfonylureas are a choice. So that is, so according to that you can um, decide with talking to your patient, understanding their circumstances because uh, family physicians know their patients and the primary care physicians and family physicians, they know their patients very well, their circumstances, their um, you know, uh, socioeconomic status. So you can have a uh, uh, very effective communication and decide on what uh, they wish to continue because um, adherence is always a problem if uh, if they are not they don't agree with their treatment so um finally I would love like to talk about a little bit of prevention so prevention uh, of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, the using, how, what is the place for statins? So as I told you before, the prevention is at different levels. For the secondary prevention of cardiovascular diseases in patients with established um, cardiovascular diseases, any further events, that is secondary prevention, the use of statins. We have got high quality, um, strong evidence and uh, we do, there's no question about it. But using um, statins for the primary prevention of CVD, that is uh, in patients without established cardiovascular diseases. So what is the evidence and what is the role of statins? Let's see what the evidence is. So I'll super quickly take you through this um, evidence summary. This is uh, the, the latest evidence summary published by the United States Primary Services Task Force in their Preventive Medicine 2022. Now, according to this uh, evidence, the population of interest is adults. Using statins uh, in adults 40 to 75 years, in whom the estimated 10-year cardiovascular disease risk is 10 or more. I'll tell you uh, a little bit more about the CVD risk uh, stratification. The grade of evidence and the recommendations are uh, uh, B-grade B evidence. It's, it's based on um, somewhat good evidence. But in the same population, uh, using statins for the primary prevention with estimated CVD risk of less than 10%, the recommendations are not so good. And for adults 76 years and older, Actually, we don't have sufficient data to comment on any recommendation. So the clinical guidance, most of the time, advises a person-centered approach when it comes to primary prevention. And it, it has to be uh, an individualized decision based on patients' needs and preferences. So before uh, deciding on any primary lipid lowering therapy or primary prevention on CVD risk, you have to do a CVD risk assessment. And what is recommended is a, it's a, a reliable or a, a, a good tool, a better tool. Because uh, we have the, some of the CVD risk stratification tools that we use um, some, some, sometimes in our hospitals. Uh, they have certain limitations because uh, uh, they don't have um, included some of the CVD risk factors some, such as the family history. So um, Q-Risk 2 is uh, a better tool if you can use, it's web-based and uh, then you, thereby you can estimate their, the, the risk of getting a, C a cardiovascular event in the next 10 years. And be mindful when you use the uh, risk stratification tools because there can be possible underestimation in certain patients like patients with HIV, patients with systemic uh, and 
autoimmune conditions uh, and also patients who have stopped smoking recently. And also you can't use these uh, tools on patients with reduced EGFR uh, or familial hypercholesterolemia or in um, patients with type 1 diabetes because their risk is anyway high. And once you do the risk stratification, please do communicate uh, that with your patient because uh, and, and, and don't use any technical words. Please communicate in their legible language and, uh, and please answer their questions in, their, in, a, in a way that they can understand because it actually gives an insight on their actual existing cardiovascular risk and, and also handing over um, some responsibility in taking care of their own illness and also support in informed decision making before um, deciding on the treatment modality because you are going to start a long-term treatment on your patient. And it is very important to uh, like uh, have an idea about the potential benefits from lifestyle changes because lifestyle cha modifications are not realistic in every patient. And, uh, and also their readiness for lifestyle modification also matters. So uh, if the lifestyle modifications are inappropriate or ineffective, of course, then we have to decide on pharmacotherapy for lipid lowering. Uh, again, a person-centered approach. And please look for any secondary causes of high lipid levels, such as what? Patients with hypothyroidism, patients with reduced renal function, they have got high lipid levels and especially hypothyroidism, uh, which is a treatable cause. Uh, will it, it, uh, after treating, will it, it itself will correct the lip, high lipid levels. So um, as, uh, at the same time, try to modify other CVD risk factors other than uh, high lipid levels. And also if you are dealing with an elderly, Please consider polypharmacy, general fertility, and the life expectancy be before deciding on any long-term medications such as the statins. And if you decide with your patient to practice lifestyle modification, after some time, please offer re-evaluation of their CVD risk. Because by doing that, one thing is, if that lifestyle modification had been successful, you give that patient some encouragement and also they get an assurance that they, this is something doable. And also if it is not realistic, then again, you can effectively communicate uh, the unrealistic nature of, because some, some pa patients, of course, they have a very uh, huge aversion to uh, these type of drugs, long-term drugs, hamadama you know. That, that is the, the so, that, that fear is the, the main um, uh, cause behind their non-adherence or incomplete adherence. So uh, like give, having a continuous um, communication with your patient, uh, you will be able to you, um, uh, you will be able to get the best out of this uh, treatment and do the best for your patients. And when to start statins for primary prevention of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease? As I told you, if lifestyle modification is ineffective or inappropriate, you have to offer statin therapy. So the recommended uh, treatment is moderate intensity statin for patients with a CVD 10-year cardiovascular disease risk of 10% or more. Uh, moderate intensity statin is usually atorvastatin 20. Um, and if they have a borderline LDL cholesterol or CVD risk, then again, um, you have to practice a more individualized decision making, uh, again, a person-centered approach. And one thing to remember is, if you have very high lipid estimations, say like a total cholesterol more than nine millimoles, non-HDL more than 7.5, or triglycerides 20 millimoles, please do seek cardiology referral because you might be dealing uh, with a patient um, uh, with 
undiagnosed familial hypercholesterolemia, which we cannot afford to miss. Okay, so, and, uh, uh, yeah, in summary, so chronic diseases burden health sector now more than ever, and, and it is, it will continue to rise um, if we don't intervene. And if we can use some of the evidence-based person-centered approaches in primary care, uh, that will definitely give us very good clinical and cost benefits. Because primary care, through its accessibility, affordability, and care continuity, is blessed placed uh, the uh, further uh, management of chronic diseases. And person-centeredness is very important because patients are the experts on their life and on their illness. Uh, these are my references. And um, I would like to um, thank Sri Lanka Medical Association and the officials in the Ministry of Health uh, for uh, inviting me and organizing this uh, event to strengthen primary care physicians. It will definitely take uh, Sri Lankan primary care to the next level. And um, finally, to you all, thank you for your time. Thank you, Madam, for that very engaging presentation. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we are drawing close to the end of proceedings for today. But before we wind up, we have to appreciate all the effort that has been put into organizing this magnanimous event. Therefore, I would like to call upon Dr. Janaka Priyashanta to deliver the vote of thanks. Most valuable invite is for the, the symposium, medical professionals, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure as the Secretary of GP Association Ratnapura to deliver the vote of thank on this symposium. First of all, I wish to extend my warmest appreciation and gratitude to SLMA President and Council for giving us this opportunity to organize this joint regional meeting on strengthening primary care position for effective management of common alignment in Ratnapura. I sincerely wish that today event would pave the way, broadening the knowledge of GPs and other medical officers on management of common elements. Further, I would like to thank Provincial Director of Health Service, Sapargamu Province, Dr. Kapila Kannangara, for their contribution in making this event a success. And also, Regional Director of Health Service, Dr. Srini Alahapperuma, for the support this today occasion. On behalf of the GP Association Ratnapura, I extend my sincere gratitude to all guest lecturers for sharing the most updated informative knowledge here with us. My special thanks gives to Dr. Chaminda Jayavardhana, who was behind this regional meeting as SLMA member, and Dr. Sandun for comparing this event and also Dr. Sujit for the all beautiful graphics and digital support you given. Furthermore, I would like to thank the President, all the office bearers of GP Association Ratnapura, PD office staff for untiring effort for the organizing this joint regional meeting. Finally, I thank all the participants for gracing this occasion and helping us to make this a memorable event. I am optimistic that the meeting today would be an eye-opener offering an enriched array of diverse topics related to our themes. Thank you all once again. Thank you. With that, we have come to the conclusion of this wonderful session. I hope all of you were able to get something, gain something good and carry on with it. Thank you. Good day. <laughs>